A House panel questions oil company executives about rising gasoline prices, recent industry profits, and company tax breaks. The House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming hosts this two-hour, 45-minute hearing. Ed Markey of Massachusetts is the chairman. The Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming is called to order. And uh, we welcome all of you to our very important hearing today. Yesterday, Americans saw that the price of gasoline hit a record high price. Today, on April Fool's Day, consumers all over America are hoping that the top executives from the five largest oil companies will tell us that these soaring gas prices are just part of some elaborate hoax. Unfortunately, it is not a joke. For nearly eight years, this administration's energy policy has been in the tank. Shortly after President Bush took office, the price of oil was under $20. A few weeks ago, oil reached an all-time record high of $111 and currently trades at about $100 a barrel. During the same period, the price of gasoline has nearly tripled from $1.11 a gallon in 2002 to yesterday's all-time high when it hit yet another record of $3.29 a gallon. And as we approach the summer driving season, skyrocketing gas prices are likely uh, to soar even higher. Each week, American consumers go to the gas pump and pay the price for this administration's failed energy policy. Twenty percent of all households in America make less than $20,000 a year. With gas prices at $3.29 a gallon, the poorest 20 percent of American households are spending nearly 10 percent of their income just on gasoline. American consumers also know that the major oil companies are reaping a major financial windfall. Big oil's profits have more than quadrupled over the last six years. Just last year alone, ExxonMobil recorded more than $40 billion in profit, the greatest corporate profit in history. And the five companies sitting before us today netted a combined $123 billion in profit in 2007. And what is the oil industry doing with all this profit? Unfortunately, it goes as much to financial engineering as to renewable engineering. Last year, the five largest oil companies spent more than $50 billion on schemes to prop up the price of their stock. And as they rake in the profits at a record clip, the major oil companies, supported by the Bush administration, are opposing legislation that would take $18 billion in tax breaks they currently receive and redirected to renewable fuels and clean energy. In April of 2005, President Bush said, quote, with $55 a barrel oil, we don't need incentives for oil and gas companies to explore. And that was true in 2005. With the price of oil now doubled and our planet's thermometer rising, this administration must end its opposition to the renewable energy incentive package that the House passed last month. So on April Fool's Day, the biggest joke of all is being played on American families by big oil who are using every trick in the book to keep billions in federal tra tax subsidies even as they rake in record profits. Three things must happen immediately in order to ensure that consumers can begin to get relief from high prices. First, the poorest Americans are now spending an average of 10 percent of their income to pay for gasoline. We need the companies here today to make a similar commitment to American families and pledge to invest at least 10 percent of their profits in renewable energy and biofuels to develop alternatives that will help consumers. Second, your companies and the Bush administration must support, not oppose, legislation that will unleash the renewable revolution we need in order to become energy independent and cut global warming emissions. And finally, the Bush administration must stop filling the strategic petroleum reserve during periods of high prices in order to send a signal to the market and oil speculators that Americans won't be held hostage by those high prices. For too long, 
this administration's energy policy has led to tax breaks for big oil and tough breaks for American families. American consumers shouldn't have to break the bank to fill the tank. The American people deserve answers, and it is time for big oil to go on record about these record prices. And now I would like to recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing is about high gas prices, and it is an issue that my Wisconsin constituents understand all too well. Due to a host of factors, including one of the highest gasoline taxes in the nation, my constituents pay some of the highest gas prices in the nation. In fact, just yesterday, the American Automobile Association website showed that gasoline is more expensive in my district than it is in Manhattan. In both places, gas is at least 50 cents a gallon higher than it was at this time last year. Already reports are showing that Wisconsin residents may soon be feeling even more pinched due to rising fuel costs. The Capital Times in Madison reported that freight truck drivers are feeling the weight of higher diesel prices, citing data from AAA Wisconsin that shows diesel averaging $4.08 a gallon, up more than 50 cents from just last month. The story correctly notes that about 80 percent of the goods shipped in the U.S. use diesel-powered trucks. The truck drivers are feeling the pinch, but it is being passed on to all of us. In fact, the high price of oil is one reason why my local investor-owned utility, We Energies, is asking state regulators to approve a rate hike. It is not surprising that gas and oil prices are going up. Worldwide demand is skyrocketing, too. Not only is there an increasing need for energy resources in this country, but countries like China and India have energy demands that far exceed their historical needs. One thing we know for sure is that the worldwide demand for energy resources is going to keep growing in the future and that we need an energy policy that will allow us to meet those needs without slowing the economy. Last May, the Select Committee had a hearing on rising gas prices where we heard of the big impact that the oil and gas companies have on the economy. Everyone knows the impact that gasoline can have on goods in the market. But we also heard that these companies create a lot of good jobs and their expanded investment in market-driven research and technology only serves to create more jobs. The oil companies that we will hear from today are going to be called on to help meet the rising global energy demand. Naturally, they are looking for new sources of traditional fossil fuels, and it is my hope they will continue to bring these new energy sources online. Unfortunately, many of those sources are on unstable parts of the world with unsavory leadership, places like Nigeria and Venezuela. But from their testimony today, it is clear that the oil companies are looking for new sources of energy like wind, solar, and biofuels. There is a growing market for these new technologies. These executives know what the future holds, both from their own studies and from groups like the National Petroleum Council. They know that their companies will have to be able to draw on diverse sources of energy if we are to meet the rising demand. And I, too, believe that energy diversity must be a key part of U.S. energy strategy, and that includes traditional fossil fuels in addition to renewable energy, improved energy efficiency, and nuclear power. Any reasonable energy policy must recognize that we need affordable supplies of energy and that oil and gas must continue to play a dominant supply role for the foreseeable future. I look forward to today's testimony from our witnesses who are striving to meet the challenge of securing energy in an insecure world and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to hear from the witnesses about their ideas about how to increase the use of renewable and alternative energy sources and reduce our dependence on oil. Uh, you have framed uh, part of the question. I mean, people are, I think, understandably uh, anxious about uh, issues, juxtaposition of record profits while paying more from the pump, and I look forward to people clarifying that part of the equation. But it leads to a discussion about what subsidies, if any, uh, oil companies actually need to continue to be successful and at what part of the energy business. Um, we have seen 
technology industry capable of making a profit selling existing cost effective technology but still receive billions of dollars in subsidies from the American taxpayer, one of which it never really uh, was intended to, uh, to get when we made uh, the change in 2004, repealing an export subsidy that was in violation of the WTO rules, the oil and gas industry was explicitly not eligible for the repealed subsidy, yet uh, through the magic of the legislative process found themselves included in the replacement benefit. Uh, a bonus to the industry that was already booming. And as you quoted President Bush, uh, oil at $55 a barrel, he said, didn't need incentives uh, for oil and gas companies to explore. Uh, I'm interested in being able to explore with our witnesses at what point an industry becomes sufficiently mature that it no longer needs as much taxpayer help. Uh, and what parts of the businesses that are represented here today do need specific subsidies to be uh, profitable? In the written testimony that I have reviewed, you describe a robust renewable and alternative energy program that virtually all the companies are involved with now and express support for renewing tax credits for the production of wind and solar power. Uh, I personally believe that this is where we should be putting scarce taxpayer resources. Uh, not into existing technology which probably no longer needs our help, but in areas where the cost of production and the curve of cost effectiveness is not quite as clear. And I look forward to being able to explore with our witnesses uh, how we have passed this point and where we need to go in the future to maximize our entry into a renewable, sustainable future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I assume we are working under the rule that if I abbreviate my opening statement, I get more time to ask questions, or is I, 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 I hear the chair at the outset? I think it's an all or nothing. It's an all or nothing situation. Very well. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, then it's an all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. I think it's extremely important uh, for us as members of Congress. Uh, as well as for all Americans to understand the myriad of reasons for today's uh, extremely high oil prices uh, and the consequent high price of gasoline. In that respect, this hearing is very timely, uh, considering that uh, gasoline oil prices recently reached a $112 per barrel high just a few weeks ago. Uh, I am extremely interested in this issue as representing a western state where we travel great distances uh, and our commutes are dramatically longer than those of my colleagues who represent uh, states along the East Coast, uh, these issues are extremely important to me. And I also find that there is a sad lacking of basic economic understanding uh, both here in the United States Congress and in the nation at large. There are many issues, I believe, which are contributing to uh, the high price uh, of oil uh, and the consequent high price of gasoline. I have in the past tried to uh, encourage further construction of refining facilities without much luck. Uh, I believe we are relying on oil for many uses that would be better suited to other uh, fuels. Uh, I am concerned that if you look at both the issues of supply and demand, uh, we face a myriad of problems. We face government imposed restrictions on supply. Uh, there are many, many places I think that all of us know here in America where we could, uh, where we have known reserves of supply, but we are not allowed for various political reasons to go and look. Uh, just over a year ago, this Congress looked at trying to get uh, either oil production or natural gas production on the outer continent continental shelf at distances far enough off uh, the shore where uh, it would be literally unknown to anybody on land, and yet uh, we could not enact that legislation. In the Intermountain West where I live, we have thousands of acres of land that are locked up, uh, and we walk away from that supply uh, at a time when demand around the world is growing dramatically. Uh, China has uh, moved quickly toward being a developed nation. It has an incredible demand for all commodities, including oil. Uh, and as that demand goes up, of course, that creates uh, a greater demand around the world. Uh, the result of this is, I believe, not surprising. And it is a spike in the cost of oil for Americans. 
uh, and a spike in the cost of gasoline for my constituents who are deeply concerned about the issue. As my colleague Mr. Sensenbrenner noted, uh, we are forced, regrettably, to rely on nations that are not our friends to supply oil. And I, it is my understanding at least that U.S. oil companies control less than 10 percent of the world's proven oil reserves, leaving American consumers often subject to oil prices determined largely by uh, foreign countries and in some instances by foreign countries who are not our friends and who uh, use that money to oppose us. Uh, obviously, we have a tremendous interest in exploring alternative forms of energy. I am keenly interested in that myself uh, and would like to hear what you have to say about it. I, however, do not believe that funding uh, alternative energies by taxing current forms of energy uh, serves American consumers well. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Just as I was walking in this room, I had a fellow from Virginia told him where I was headed into, and he said, Congressman, I own stock in one of those companies, but give them hell anyway. And I thought it was kind of indicative of what you know is the public sentiment out uh, across the country. But I think that public sentiment is not because Americans don't understand the laws of supply and demand, and we know that demand is going up with China and India, and, and supply is somewhat limited. It is because of these two great abuses that they feel are going on and that create this great anger besides just the price rise. And that is, first, they cannot understand when they are paying 328 or 344 out in my state of Washington at the pump, why then you then reach into their pockets and take out another $18 billion on April 15th out of their tax bill. They can't understand that. And when they ask you to give them to give you H, I think that is one of the reasons because Americans believe, and I think rightfully so, that if you were going to give awards for taxpayer abuses, this would win the Heisman and the Oscar and uh, the Nobel Prize. To reach into Americans' pockets a tax time to take this when these prices are going up like this. And secondly, Americans are concerned that even though we know, we know we have to wean ourselves off of oil and gas, that global warming demands this, even though Americans know that we are the most innovative people in the face of the earth, we are still seeing a very, very small as a percentage of your revenues investment in the clean energy technologies that Americans know that we can perfect to really create a, a clean energy revolution in this country. So I hope that uh, we will produce some thoughts about that. I will give you one saving grace. I know this can be difficult hearing for you. I am not going to ask for your home phone numbers. Um, it, and that could be the most effective regulatory system we have. But that is the one break you will get today. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. I want to welcome our witnesses, and we look forward to your testimony. Um, I share the concerns you have already heard from members of both sides of the aisle. Um, certainly in a district that spans 70,000 square miles, I can tell you I am hearing a lot from folks I represent, farmers and ranchers and others who commute extraordinarily long distances about the price of fuel. You know that. Um, we hear it for diesel as well, especially in the farm community. This is, the inputs into our agricultural products are, are a real problem. What I would like to get to today is to find out how do we overcome this. Now, I am a big supporter of renewable energy and have been before it was even popular. I, over uh, the last month, bought my second hybrid vehicle. I now drive one in Oregon and one here in Washington, D.C. And with all due respect, I have cut my uh, payments to you by 66 percent with my new one in Oregon. I want to know, though, how we do both. How do we meet the oil and gas needs of today in America while we develop um, the renewable energy sources, the biofuels, the alternatives that, frankly, are being developed in my district and, and elsewhere around the country? How do we get those going while we still meet this demand? And we know part of the price spike we are paying on the world market is related to the devalued dollar. I mean, that is basic economics. You see it. Um, we import so much. How do we get America more energy independent? How do we rely less on imports from foreign countries, uh, many of whom, quite frankly, let us be honest, don't like us very well, Venezuela among them? Um, and how do we, so how do we develop our own resources? What can we do to help in that effort rather than just throw rocks at you and your profits, which I think, you know, probably a lot of them would come from most of our districts. I want to know how we solve the problem. That is what Americans want us to do here. 
we can gang up on you all, and certainly that will happen probably today, as you well anticipate. But I want to get beyond that and know how do we fix the problem in America so we are energy independent, so we are secure in this country, so we have the oil and gas we need as well as develop the renewables, so over the span we can grow out of an oil-based economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Markey, and thank you for conducting this hearing. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Let me start with uh, saying that I believe that the laws of supply and demand, especially as relates to uh, oil, are completely broken and malfunctioning. I would like to know your opinion on this. I would like to know whether you think that, in fact, speculators are driving up the cost and paper is to account for a number of the reasons that, let's say, senior citizens have to turn over their entire Social Security check in order to pay for uh, oil that is delivered to their homes in the Northeast. And inasmuch as you receive $107 billion annually in taxpayer dollars, do you think that that is appropriate? I uh, believe that uh, and the Independent uh, Connecticut Petroleum Association is outraged over this Rock Rib Republican screaming that this whole situation has been nothing more than manipulation around greed, and they see it day in and day out with the customers that they are attempting to make deliveries to who are getting their homes foreclosed on, can't afford prescription drugs, can't afford to buy the food necessitated for their living, and yet are turning over their Social Security checks uh, so that they can pay for their fuel. That is the kind of problem that we are in. And lastly, and uh, with 3 percent of the reserves entirely in this nation, is it possible, do you believe that we can actually drill our way to energy independence? Great. gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This committee was formed to study the issue of global climate change, how it impacts society, how it impacts our environment. And today we are going to hear from the leaders of companies that many in the environmental movement blame for many of the challenges that we face today. Of course, these are the big oil companies. And in the difficult economy that our nation faces, this is the one industry that is thriving more than ever because of the incredibly high cost of oil. And everybody complains about the high cost, including probably every member of Congress as well. But I will say this at the outset. I think we should all take a very good look in the mirror uh, as who's some of the culprits about some of the high costs. We have done nothing as a Congress to advantage ourselves of our own domestic supply of energy resources in places like the Anwar or offshore reserves that would make us much less uh, dependent on foreign oil. We have not made it very much easier to site new refineries that could increase the supply of gasoline and reduce prices, and we have regulated ourselves to an extent that drives prices up. But we have asked many in industry to make sacrifices and in new investments, and many of them have actually responded. Our domestic auto manufacturers have borne the brunt, quite frankly, of this effort, and they are responding. They have heard the call, they have shouldered the mandates, and they are responding. Many other American companies and industries are also responding as well. But despite all of this effort, our economy is still overly reliant on oil. The big oil companies continue to reap huge benefits. <clears throat> And I would I say this, I believe this very strongly, that before we are members of Congress or we're members of or before we're oil executives or what have you, before we're anything else, we are all Americans. And every American has a responsibility to help reduce our dependence on foreign energy sor sources and also to conserve energy. And I hope uh, on this committee, what we're, what we all are very familiar with the record profits being reaped by the oil industry, which in fact stand in very sharp contrast to the financial situations of many other industries who have been asked to make sacrifices to help us solve our energy problems. I hope that uh, your companies who are in a position really to be a major player in a brighter economic environmental future, that you do the right thing with these profits. Simply having these profits fatten the checkbooks of a few instead of investing for the good of us all is down the wrong path. You are in the position to advance new cleaner technologies that will not only change your industry, but could change the entire world if you have the courage and the foresight to do so. And if you do not have that courage, if you refuse to change with America, then I believe you are going to see a backlash from your customers, the American people who are sick and tired of paying huge prices at the pump only to see your company swimming in their money. And you are going to see a backlash from other industries that are being decimated by high fuel prices. And because of that, you will also see a backlash from this Congress that could go further than just the elimination of tax breaks that you currently enjoy. enjoy. Uh, and when we see that your companies have made combined profits of over $123 billion last year alone, 
And I also think you will see a backlash from your shareholders who will bear the brunt of the pain if you do not evolve to other energy technologies that will eventually replace oil as a primary energy source. So I hope that what we will hear today is not just a defense of record profits or a casting of blame on others for high prices or defense of tax breaks, breaks without the needs of good corporate citizenship or sticking your head in the sand and denying the effort to bring about alternatives to oil. And I look forward to all of your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman uh, and Ranking Member uh, Sensenbrenner, thank you for this, this meeting. Uh, I think all of you are already hearing uh, what's going on uh, at home. We, we've been on a, a break. Uh, it's, it's actually been a, a work break for most of us. And one of the things that we hear over and over again is what are you guys going to do about the uh, high uh, price of gasoline? And I, I spoke with a woman uh, about a week ago uh, who earns $18,000 a year and can't afford to fill up her tank to get to work. Kansas City, Missouri does not have mass transit. We only have buses. And so uh, she's about to lose her job because she can't afford to get to it. And so she's losing all the way around. And with the, uh, the, the skyrocketing uh, price of a, a barrel of, of oil and people paying more than $3 a gallon uh, in Missouri, uh, the, the anger level is rising significantly. And my concern is that we uh, not have a dialogue today about uh, you know whose fault it is. I, I, I think I, I came here prepared to hear everyone say it's not our fault. Uh, but I, I, I think it is the fault of people in this room, and I think something can be done. The perception is terrible. It is I mean, people talk about the perception of Congress and you know our approval ratings. Yours, your approval ratings are lower than ours, and that, that means you are down low. Uh, and I think you probably have the lowest approval ratings in the nation. So I'm hoping that before uh, this session is over, you can, can raise your approval rating by giving some real answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to the balance of my time. Great. gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm really glad that you're here today. I appreciate you taking the time to come here to discuss climate change and energy independence. Uh, we want to see our country move towards energy independence, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't sacrifice jobs in America. And Congressman Cleaver, I, I too was on a break recently and I heard people talking about things, but one of the biggest things I heard about when I was home is that people were concerned about their food prices going up because of ethanol. They think that the corn is, they're using all the corn in this country, that the people are going to the grocery store, a loaf of bread costs a lot of money right now. And that's one of the ways we tried to address it and I think that that's a big problem. I heard that more than people talking about gas prices, actually, uh, talking about a loaf of bread. And, uh, you know, that's a big problem. I want to uh, thank again all of you for being here. Uh, also, Mr. Lowe from ConocoPhillips, I'm, I appreciate you being here. The ConocoPhillips is in my district. It's a big company and they employ a lot of people. One of the things, too, I, I, I get tired of hearing about is everybody, all politicians, you can't hear a political speech almost day out someone saying big oil, big oil. Um, I guess every politician has to have a tangible devil to fight, but uh, I get tired of hearing that. I do want to hear about uh, what you guys have to say about uh, what's going on, and I appreciate you again for being here and taking the time to discuss this very important issue. Thank you. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all our witnesses for being here. Um, as we all know, the price of oil has been rising at a dizzying pace for the last several years recently shattering the all-time high and hovering above $100 per barrel. The numbers and impacts on both sides of the equation are staggering. Today, the average price of regular unleaded gas in the United States is $3.29, up 60 cents from just last year. In New York, the situation is even worse, with the cost at over $3.40. And my constituents talk about the rockets and feathers syndrome, where the price seems to go up like a rocket, and when it comes down, it kind of comes down like a feather, not quite so fast. 
Uh, President Bush may not have known about the concern that gas was going to break the $4 mark, but with prices already well above $3 before the summer, most Americans don't need to be reminded. They already see the impact on their bottom line every day. On the other side of the coin, we have the companies you gentlemen represent uh, before us today. Since 2002, the combined profits of the five largest oil companies have quadrupled. Last year, they made over $123 billion, shattering dollar records of their own. During this hearing, there will be a great deal of discussion trying to explain away these profits, saying we need to reinvest, we're a big company per dollar, we don't make that much more than anybody else. But the bottom line is that these are the biggest profits in corporate history. And if the oil companies aren't make a, making a killing off of these prices, who is? Certainly not the average family that pays more than it can afford to drive to school or for dad to drive to work. Something is wrong and we need to fix it. We need to stabilize our economy, give working families a break, and take action to mitigate climate change. On this last front, I am encouraged that some of uh, the witnesses have expressed support for a carbon reduction plan and support for an indeed investment in the renewable and alternative energy uh, sources. I hope we will be hearing today about how you can follow through and work with Congress to shape a policy that will take on climate change and also save our constituents from the uh, squeeze they are currently caught in the middle of. And thank you very much, Member Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yep. The gentleman from New York, uh, this time has expired, and the Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each of you for coming before us today, and my hope is that our committee will have a reasoned discussion with you and that we will benefit from your experience and from your expertise and insight. I also hope that we are not going to sit here and try to place blame for what may be causing this. We have a problem to solve, and the problem is the high cost at the pump. Now, since January 07, we have passed new energy taxes, new mandates, new burdens, new regulatory burdens on energy companies trying to impose and move toward renewable energy. And it would appear that we are not getting the results that we want from some of those actions because we have seen gas go from 226 a gallon up to 329 where it is today. We have seen over a 44 percent increase on the family budget. For every $1 that gallon of gas goes up, that costs a family, an average family, about $600 directly out of their pocketbook. You all know the prices of crude, and today they are hovering right around $100. So there are some that would like to place blame on all of you and would place extra taxes on you, but I have got a question that I would like to pose, and it is this. If we take those actions, if we put more taxes on you and more regulation and more compliance, would it put this nation at risk for even more dependence on foreign unfriendly sources of oil? What about a carbon tax? or a cap-and-trade system. What is that going to do to the American public? Uh, we all know that America has the capacity to become energy independent and help lower energy costs. Do we have the national will to do this? We all know we have vast coal, oil, and gas resources lying on or within our land and off the coast, and these can be developed. And our allies to the north are developing access to one of the world's largest sources of natural energy resources in the Canadian shale oil. Let's not be short-sighted. Let's put the family first. Let's not let fear grip and manipulate our policies. We have a problem to solve. We need to work together on this. I yield the balance of my time. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the witnesses for joining us today on this critical topic. In particular, I would like to, to thank Mr. Robertson for coming here to represent Chevron, which is located in my congressional district in San Ramon, California. While it is obvious that businesses must show profits and be accountable to their shareholders, we seem to have a perfect storm of factors that have led us to the topic we are considering today, record high oil prices, record price record high profits uh, for oil companies, and clear evidence that the Earth's atmosphere is warming. Uh, but I am hopeful today's hearing will help us better understand exactly what the industry's perspective on these issues is. Uh, and as someone with a background in renewable energy, 
I don't believe that the oil and natural gas companies should be at odds with the renewable industry. Uh, the two should work in, con uh, in concert, and that makes perfectly good business sense. Uh, but while petroleum resources are limited, uh, renewable resources have the uh, potential to address our nation's long-term energy needs. So by investing in renewable energy, uh, oil and gas companies can look toward the future and can pioneer initiatives uh, with your resources that will give us significant long-term dividends. Uh, we know that progress is being made uh, by companies such as Chevron, which is investing um, in energy efficiency, global uh, geothermal hydrogen uh, and biofuels. This approach should be more widely adopted, in my opinion, uh, and it embraced across the board. The companies represented today have at their disposal the resources necessary to move forward to securing our nation's long-term energy future. And what, what we need now is a commitment and vision to make that happen. Again, I look forward to your testimony uh, and yield back to the Chair. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this important hearing and also uh, welcome to our witnesses. While uh, I don't pretend to lay blame on you specifically, I do lay blame on the fact that our constituents certainly need to have some questions answered. And how is it that I can explain when I go back home, coming back from our recess, that uh, the price of a gallon of gasoline in my district, East Los Angeles, San Gabriel Valley, working class blue collar is upwards of $3.69 a gallon. For diesel, it is over $4. And uh, the questions that I get from people, especially our truckers, because we have, a very, we have a very busy port in Los Angeles, and much of that transaction occurs through my district. So people are going broke, they are going bankrupt, but they want to know why is it that these folks are making such a heavy profit, a large profit over a small span of time. And that money then can't be also those profits redirected into renewable uh, energy and fuels and, and hopefully uh, increase uh, the ability to create new green collar jobs. Every time that we keep away from the message of creating and investing in the United States with renewable energy, I think we are losing upwards of 100,000 jobs. At least that is what I am being told. So I am just asking you to please step up to the plate. Help us find those answers to our questions. Help us look for other alternatives. And the suggestions that I don't want to hear are that we are going to keep drilling uh, where we already know folks in our district, particularly California, do not want to allow for uh, more drilling along our coast and opening up old refineries like in the city of Whittier, uh, Nixon country it used to be known as, where we have some oil fields owned by, I think, Chevron. So I would just leave you with that and ask you to uh, please uh, keep in mind the constituents that we represent and yield back the balance of my time. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired and the Chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today at this hearing. Yesterday, as we know, light Swede crude for May delivery was trading above $101 per barrel on the New York Mercantile Exchange. And these developments con continue to be shocking and financially burdensome for families and businesses across the country, especially rural America like South Dakota, the state that I represent here in the Congress. Since people drive such long distances daily to get to work, to get their kids to school, to transport goods for their small businesses. The average price for a barrel of oil in January of 2002, about six years ago, was less than $20 a barrel. So even if we discount all the other problems, whether they are geopolitical, environmental supply that flow from our addiction to oil, its price volatility alone seems to me dictates that we must more aggressively move to diversify our energy sources. Now, I strongly believe one solution to this oil addiction is an increased use of domestically produced biofuels, such as ethanol, which have the potential to meet a significant portion of our nation's energy needs over the coming decades if we put the proper policies in place. This includes the robust and aggressive renewable fuel standard passed last December that drives the development and large-scale production of cellulosic ethanol in the decades to come. And I just would have to note for my colleagues on the committee I know Mr. Sullivan mentioned the concern of his constituents about food prices. It has been shown that it has been energy prices associated with the, pr the processing and the transport of food far more than the cost of the commodities such as corn and wheat 
that are substantially driving up costs of food. And perhaps what we should evaluate, Mr. Chairman, and that is some of what we have been trying to do and some of what we have proposed in energy policies that have passed the House as it relates to reevaluating some of the policies we put in place years ago, including in 2005, but before that. Because for those of you that don't represent agriculture, our farm policies, most of them, kick in when prices are low. So we save taxpayers money when we are not paying loan deficiency payments or countercyclical cyclical payments when the price of corn is where it has been, over $4 a bushel, the price of wheat, price of soybeans with what they have been. And so we need to look at doing the same thing when it looks like other commodities prices are so volatile and going up to reevaluate how we spend taxpayer dollars when prices are high and when they are low. And we will look forward to getting your thoughts on that as well as your thoughts on biofuels distribution and production across the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. General Lady's uh, time has expired mm -hmm. and all time for opening statements from the members mm -hmm. has been completed. So now we will turn to our panel. Uh, and uh, we will uh, give each one of them an opportunity to make an opening statement uh, before this committee. Uh, our first witness. Uh, today is Mr. Stephen Simon, Senior Vice President for ExxonMobil. Mr. Simon has over 40 years of experience in the oil industry, 35 of them spent with Exxon. He has served in his current role as Senior Vice President since 2004. We welcome you, Mr. Simon. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee. The world's economy runs on energy. Americans depend on it every day to fuel their cars, heat their homes, and power their businesses. Because energy is so important, all of us have a responsibility to engage in an open, honest, informed debate about our energy future that is grounded in reality and intent on finding viable solutions. In that spirit, I would like to make three points during my allotted time. First, our earnings although high in absolute terms, need to be viewed in the context of the scale and cyclical long-term nature of our industry, as well as the huge investment requirements. Second, stable tax and regulatory policies are essential to encouraging needed investments. Imposing punitive taxes on American energy companies, which are already paying record taxes, will discourage the sustained investments needed to continue safeguarding U.S. energy security. Third, all reliable and economic forms of energy are needed to meet growing needs. But the pursuit of alternative fuels must not detract from the development of oil and gas. Allow me to elaborate on each point in turn. Because of the massive scale of our industry, our profitability in absolute terms is large, particularly in the current up cycle. But in 2007, the oil and gas industry earned, on average, about 8.3 cents per dollar of sales, near the Dow Jones Industrial Average of major industries of 7.8 cents per dollar of sales. Because ours is a commodity business, earnings rise and fall in cycles. We are currently in an up cycle, strongly influencing our current profitability. But we have seen up and down cycles before. In 1980, crude oil prices reached record levels, approaching the equivalent of over $100 a barrel in today's dollars, and many were predicting that oil prices would soar to over $250 a barrel in today's dollars. But those predictions were wrong. By the mid-1980s, prices had fallen dramatically and the industry was in dire straits. Ours is a long-term business with energy projects requiring enormous investments spanning decades that must carry through both the up and down cycles. Over the last 25 years, we have invested $355 billion, which is more than we earn. In the last five years alone, we have invested almost $89 billion, including about $25 billion in North America. Over the next five years, ExxonMobil plans to invest at least $125 billion. We depend on high earnings during the up cycle to sustain this level of investment over the long term, including the down cycles. 
regarding taxes. Currently, the energy industry pays record levels. While our worldwide profits have grown, our worldwide income taxes have grown even more. From 2003 to 2007, our earnings grew by 89 percent, but our income taxes grew by 170 percent. <coughs> Over the last five years, ExxonMobil's U.S. total tax bill exceeded our U.S. earnings by $19 billion. A recent survey by Tax Notes of 80 leading U.S. companies revealed that these companies had an average income tax rate of 30 percent. ExxonMobil's effective income tax rate in 2007 was 44 percent. To discriminate against American energy companies as the proposed changes to Section 199 and the foreign tax credit do would not only add to these taxes, but also impact investment in future energy supplies by redirecting needed capital and creating competitive disadvantages for American energy companies competing overseas. Taxes should be fair, stable, and pro-competitive principles these proposals violate. Finally, regarding alternatives, the International Energy Agency forecasts that oil and gas will continue to meet about 54 percent of global energy demand in 2030. Alternative fuels also play an important role, but the IEA forecasts that renewable energy sources such as biofuels, wind, solar, and geothermal combined will account for only about 2 percent of global energy supply in 2030, again an indicator of the scale required. These findings are closely aligned with our own energy outlook of 2007, which I respectfully submit into the records of this proceeding for the Committee's consideration. The market is the most effective means of determining the future energy mix in a way that maximizes supply and minimizes cost. Government mandates and subsidies distort market forces and impede technological innovation. Raising taxes on oil and gas production to subsidize alternatives will likely lead to less overall energy production, not more. And as many independent observers are now noting, such mandates can have unintended consequences. Continuing to provide Americans with the energy they need, reliably and responsibly, is a challenge ExxonMobil employees are determined to meet. Government can help by creating a level playing field and promoting fair, stable, pro-competitive regulatory and tax policies. It is this kind of leadership that is needed to meet our nation's energy challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Our next witness is Mr. John Hoffmeister. He is the president of the Shell Oil Company and has led that company since March of 2005. We welcome you, Mr. Hoffmeister. And if you could move in a little bit closer to the microphone, I think it would help uh, everyone. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee, I welcome the opportunity to be here today. If there is no objection, I will summarize the statement I have submitted for the record. This hearing comes at the end of Shell's 18-month national dialogue on energy security. We travel to 50 cities engaging more than 15,000 Americans in a dialogue on energy security. We heard what you are hearing. Americans are worried about the rising cost of energy. Mr. Chairman, I believe you have said that the nation's energy challenge requires a commitment on the scale of the Manhattan Project during World War II or the space program of the 1960s. I agree. The price of a barrel of light sweet crude has gone up 300 percent in four years. This increase is due to a combination of factors which are, for the most part, not controlled or much influenced by the actions of oil companies. For example, growth in, demand, growth in global demand for oil, geopolitical events affecting international supply, developments in the financial market contributed to the rise in prices, skyrocketing cost of materials, labor and engineering services, a shortage of capacity in energy services and materials more difficult access to oil and gas resources around the world, available energy resources are found in difficult or hostile areas, and closer to home, U.S. energy resources are unavailable. Today I will talk about three aspects of the energy challenge. First, what is the energy supply demand outlook? Second, what is Shell doing to meet the energy challenge? And third, what policymakers can do? First, the energy supply demand outlook is sobering. Demand is increasing 
unrelentingly. Although oil and natural gas will be used to meet more than half our energy needs for decades, U.S. oil and gas production has fallen steadily for the last 35 years. Why? Because government policies place domestic oil and gas resources off limits. The U.S. government restricts supply to U.S. consumers. The result? We import more oil to meet our growing demand. In 2006, we imported 3.7 billion barrels of oil, more than seven times the amount imported in 1970. This brings me to my second point, what Shell is doing to meet the energy challenge. We are making significant capital investment to produce more energy and more kinds of energy to meet global demand. Today we have doubled the number of new projects under construction than we had in 2004. Last year we spent some $25 billion on capital investment worldwide to develop energy projects. This year Shell will spend between $28 and $29 billion, the largest capital expenditure program in, an oil, in the oil and gas industry. Wind. We are involved in 11 wind projects across Europe and the United States where we have wind farms in six states with more under development. Solar. Shell is an international developer of thin film solar technology to generate electricity from the sun's energy. Biofuels. Shell is the world's largest blender of biofuels by volume and one of the world's largest distributors of transport biofuels. Shell is a leader in the development of advanced biofuels such as cellulosic ethanol. Hydrogen. Shell is a leader in developing transportation solutions with hydrogen. We operate the nation's first integrated gasoline hydrogen station nearby here at our Shell station on Benning Road. We also have proprietary gasification technology to convert coal and biomass into cleaner fuel. We lead in gas to liquids technology to produce cleaner transportation fuels. We hold a leadership position in the production of liquefied natural gas here in the U.S., including at two existing LNG terminals. But Shell continues to be an industry leader in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Note that the costs of deep water exploration and production are immense and rising. Last year, for example, the average daily cost for a deep water exploration well in the Gulf of Mexico per day was $759,000. Shell has a world-class manufacturing organization to better meet customer demand of finished products. In the U.S., our joint venture, Motiva, is spending around $7 billion to double the capacity of its refinery at Port Arthur, Texas. When finished, it will be one of the largest refineries in the U.S. and the world. In oil sands and oil shale, Shell is investing in the technology and infrastructure to develop vast oil sands in Canada and oil shale in the United States. To my third point, what can policymakers do to meet the energy challenge? First, the oil and gas development can occur in an environmentally responsible way. In 2006, Congress opened new areas in the Gulf of Mexico to exploration and development. More such access is warranted so that U.S. consumers can have access to U.S. natural resources. Congress also provided energy producing states and local coastal communities with a revenue stream to help ensure economic and environmental stability. Such revenue sharing should be made available to all areas adjacent to offshore development. Second, we need all forms of energy, plus conservation and energy efficiency. I commend Congress for including stronger CAFE provisions and other conservation measures in the 2007 Energy Bill. Congress should continue to encourage conservation. Third, Shell supports reducing greenhouse gases through a cap and trade program coupled with sector approaches. We must work now to address CO2 emissions as we make the transition from fossil fuels to new energy sources. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hoffmeister. Our, our next uh, witness is Mr. Peter Robertson, who is the Vice Chairman of Chevron. Uh, he has served as Vice Chairman of the Board of Chevron since 2002. He has, he has spent 15 years with that uh, company. We welcome you, sir. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner and members of the committee, my name is Peter Robertson and I am Vice Chairman of Chevron Corporation and I am here today proudly representing 59,000 Chevron employees, 27,000 of whom work here in the United States. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the energy issues that are very much on your minds and those of all Americans. I will address three issues, rising oil prices, our commitment to providing energy including renewables, and policies to ensure that we enhance our energy security. Four years ago, we sent a letter to members of Congress, the administration, cabinet members, as well as trade associations and think tanks. It foreshadowed the issues we face today and included concrete ideas for action. 
The letter said we face a new reality, volatility, high prices, greater competition for resources, and heightened geopolitical risks. Today, this new reality is here, and it's costing us. All Americans feel the pain of $100 oil, and it's not just at the pump. Everything is more expensive. People are concerned about rising costs, and rightly so. The world is consuming oil at a never-increasing rate, and it is projected to continue. There are a billion people who enjoy our standard of living, and there are billions more striving for the same. The current system is straining to meet their needs. There's dramatically reduced, capacity, reduced spare capacity, and there's no room for error. Any disruption or perceived threat of disruption typically sends prices up, and the declining value of the dollar has only worsened the situation. The situation is not sustainable, and it's time to take urgent action. So what are we doing? Chevron produces almost one billion barrels of oil equivalent a year, and as large as that number sounds, it, sells, it serves less than 3% of world demand. And in the US, our refineries produce 6 billion gallons of gasoline each year, another large number. But that's less than 5% of America's gasoline consumption. Between 2002 and 2007, Chevron invested approximately $73 billion in new energy supplies, more than we earned. This year, we'll spend another $23 billion, including $2.3 billion in US refining and marketing activities. We've added 1 million gallons a day in gasoline capacity over the last two years. Let's talk about renewable energy. Today, Chevron is the world's largest producer of geothermal energy. Between 2007 and 2009, we plan to spend $2.5 billion on renewables and energy efficiency services. We formed a range of partnerships to pursue next generation biofuels. Let me give you one example. We teamed up with Weyerhaeuser Corporation because we need partners. They know plants, we know fuels. Together, we provide the unique combination necessary to meet this challenge. But it will take time to have a meaningful impact. A large biofuels plant in the, in the US produces in a year what one of our refineries produces in a single week. The enormous scale of the energy system means that we must continue to bring traditional energy supplies to market, even as we accelerate the development of renewables. But increasing supply is only one important step. We also need to aggressively moderate demand. America needs to become a nation of energy savers. Chevron Energy Solutions has completed more than 800 energy efficiency and renewable energy projects, largely in public facilities, reducing emissions and saving on average nearly 30 percent in energy and operational costs. In closing, I want to emphasize what we can do together to help consumers. The National Petroleum Council study involved 1,000 participants, scientists and NGOs, industrial consumers and policy experts. It recommended five strategies ranging from moderating demand to expanding supply, to increasing research. It has given us sound, sensible, achievable solutions. Now we need action. We strongly urge you to implement its recommendations. But first, we need to change our nation's conventional wisdom about energy development and use. On the demand side, our country needs to value energy as a precious resource. We need a Made in America solution, enabled by everything from human ingenuity to smart buildings to advanced vehicles. On the supply side, we need to be sensitive to the scale and time frames required to alter the energy mix. We need your help to open up the 85 percent of the outer continental shelf that is off limits. We can't expect other countries to expand their resource development to meet our needs as we limit our development without good reason. And we need your help in dealing with the inefficiencies in the gasoline market. There are 17 boutique fuel requirements across the country. More requirements on fuels are being added through renewable fuel mandates and proposed climate policies. These important policies must be advanced in a way that Americans can afford. The time for action is now. During the five minutes it took me to deliver my remarks, the world has consumed the energy equivalent of 35 million gallons of oil equivalent. Our collective leadership and ingenuity can set a path for true progress. At Chevron, we'll continue to do our part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. Our next uh, witness is John Lowe. He is the Executive Vice President of ConocoPhillips. Uh, over the last eight years, he has held multiple senior level positions with that company. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we appreciate the opportunity to come before the committee to discuss our alternative fuels investments as well as our investments to meet current energy needs. ConocoPhillips favors developing all forms of energy, conventional, renewable, and alternative. However, we recognize that even with aggressive implementation of alternative energy, 
Most sources estimate that fossil fuels must still supply two-thirds of world energy in 2030. We cannot attain an alternative energy future in a few short decades. Global energy demand is too high, technological development and infrastructure construction take too long, and the cost would be too great. This makes it essential that we build the political will to utilize our fossil fuel resources. We must also develop the ability to use them in cleaner forms. And we must disavow the misconception that alternative sources can quickly and easily assume the energy burden. ConocoPhillips is already preparing for the future. Our reinvestments into our business continue exceeding our income. We earned $12 billion in 2007, but reinvested $13 billion. And we have over $15 billion in investments planned for 2008. In North America, we are spending billions of dollars to expand supplies by developing the Canadian oil sands and building infrastructure to transport the oil to the, to the U.S. In pursuit of natural gas, we are conducting major drilling programs and building pipelines and two LNG regas terminals. <laughs> Downstream, we are increasing our refining capacity and ability to produce cleaner fuels. You have also asked us to describe our efforts in renewable and alternative energy. Although these are currently not part of our core businesses, ethanol represents 5 percent of our U.S. gasoline volumes, making us one of the nation's largest ethanol blenders and users. We are test marketing E85 and biodiesel. We produce renewable diesel fuel. We are, wor we are working to develop biofuels from agricultural waste. We are funding university research into the next generation of renewable fuels like cellulosic ethanol. We are evaluating opportunities to invest in solar, wind and geothermal power. To make electric vehicles more practical, we are developing better materials for lithium-ion batteries. And to transform coal and petroleum coke into clean-burning synthetic natural gas, we have developed proprietary technology and have two multi-billion dollar projects planned. This subcommittee is also charged with addressing climate change. ConocoPhillips favors congressional enactment of a mandatory framework to reduce carbon emissions, and we are actively researching potential carbon capture and storage. These efforts show what can be achieved by the industry's technical, financial, and human resources. Our capabilities must not be undermined by punitive tax measures or counterproductive policies like those that threaten our co-venture with Tyson Foods. Two years ago, we formed a unique relationship with Tyson to develop a new technology to produce renewable diesel from byproduct animal fats. Unlike most biofuels, our product can be transported by pipeline. Congress enacted an incentive for the feedstock, but the House is attempting to deny us equal treatment in utilizing this incentive, which is afforded to all other biodiesels. This would make our technology uncompetitive. If Congress intends to encourage meaningful alternative fuels development, it is critical that all related tax policies and mandates be feedstock and technology neutral and that R&D efforts not be undermined. The market should decide which technologies go forward. Hopefully, government and industry can move beyond today's all too often adversarial relationship. There is much we can do together to increase supplies, encourage efficiency, develop alternatives and address climate change. But have no doubt, the U.S. is engaged in a global race. Other countries are working cooperatively with their energy industries to secure new supplies. Unless our domestic companies are allowed to compete on level ground, we run the risk of marginalizing U.S. oil and gas industry and ultimately undermining U.S. energy supply. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. And our final witness is uh, Mr. Robert Malone, who is the chairman and president of EP America. Uh, Mr. Malone has led BP America since 2006. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the Select Committee, good afternoon. My name is Bob Malone and I am the Chairman and President of BP in America. We are the nation's largest producer of domestic oil and gas and one of the nation's largest energy investors. We expect to spend here in the United States $30 billion over the next five years to expand and extend production of natural gas from the Rocky Mountain West, to renew critical oil and gas infrastructure on the north slope of Alaska, to continue development in the deep water Gulf of Mexico, and to increase gasoline production from key Midwest refineries. 
In the area of alternative energy, we are nearly doubling the capacity of our Frederick, Maryland solar plant, the largest integrated solar manufacturing facility in the United States. By the end of this year, we expect to have 1,000 megawatts of U.S. wind power capacity online, increasing to 2,400 megawatts by the end of 2010. That's enough to power more than 700,000 homes. We're already one of the largest blenders of ethanol in the nation. However, over the next decade, we will invest more than 500 million in the search for a new generation of biofuel that contains more energy, has less impact on the environment, and which is not made from a food crop. We know high energy prices are having an adverse impact on our nation's economy and your constituents and our customers. We can't change the way the world market relies, and this nation relies on 60% of its oil from foreign countries. But we can work with this Congress, with the administration, and with governments and consumers across this nation to move towards greater energy security and a lower carbon energy future. To be clear, BP America is working hard to expand and to diversify U.S. energy supply and is committed to reducing the environmental impact of both energy production and consumption. Our operations span the country, and many employ technologies that didn't even exist a decade ago. Our investment across the entire energy spectrum is huge. Over the last five years, we've invested $31.5 billion in development of U.S. energy security. During 2007, we invested three quarters of a billion dollars, or 10 percent of our capital budget, on alternative energy. But the hard truth is that even the major improvements in energy efficiency with the rapid growth of solar, wind, and biofuels, the United States will consume more oil, more natural gas, and coal in 2030 than it does today. The United States, with 5 percent of the world's population, consumes 25 percent of the world's daily oil production. The U.S. should produce more of the energy it consumes, and it has a responsibility to use that energy wisely. U.S. energy policy must address both energy supply and energy demand. On the supply side, we support incentives for alternative energy. But taxing one form of energy to encourage production of another will reduce our ability to keep up with the growing U.S. energy demand. The result will be less investment, less production, tighter energy markets, and potentially even higher prices at the pump. This nation should be encouraging production of all forms of energy, especially oil and gas. On the demand side, we have to encourage conservation and drive energy efficiency. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, in the notice of this hearing, you expressed a desire for a real conversation about energy. I'm here on behalf of BP to have that conversation. The energy challenge facing this nation is enormous. BP is serious about bringing new sources of oil and gas to the U.S. market. We're also serious about building a sustainable, profitable alternative energy business that's capable of delivering the clean, affordable power that consumers want. My company stands ready to work with you and others to address the energy and environmental needs of this nation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Malone, very much. And that uh, completes the time for opening statements from our witnesses. And now we'll turn to recognize members of the committee for uh, questions of the panel. The chair will recognize himself for five minutes for that purpose. Uh, Mr. Simon, uh, last year ExxonMobil reported $40 billion in profits, uh, $28 billion in stock buybacks, uh, $7.5 billion in dividends and executive uh, compensation. But all I can really find is no more than a commitment of $100 million uh, in investment in renewables over the next 10 years. Why is that, Mr. Simon? Why is your company not investing in renewables? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to address the area of alternative fuel. When you go back to the year 2000-2001, we as a corporation 
recognize that we had a huge challenge in front of us, not only as a corporation, but as an industry, in meeting a significant growth in energy requirements, estimated about 40 percent in the year 2030 compared to 2005, while still managing the risks associated with climate change as driven by the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. At that time, we looked at every component, every facet of alternative energy. We had our best and brightest minds, the scientists and engineers of the highest caliber in our corporation, look at it on a fundamental basis. We looked at it all the way from production on the one hand all the way through consumption on the other. We call it a well-to-wheels analysis. We looked at it on an energy basis on the energy balance. How much have you invested in renewable energy, Mr. Simon, for 2008? What is your budget for renewable energy at ExxonMobil? And I will get to that, Mr. Chairman. I only have five minutes. It is important for us to get it out on the table. What is the investment in renewable energy? Please. Recognizing that we needed to do something of a great magnitude the current generation of fossil fuels don't work. What we did is we said we needed the best and brightest minds from all walks of life, and we initiated the Global Climate and Energy Project at Stanford University, which is about and how much money are you about a hundred million dollar investment? A hundred million years. dollars, but you made forty billion dollars last year, Mr. Chairman. Putting more money into something does not necessarily equal progress. Well, Shell we, is putting money. We, Shell is putting money into wind. BP is putting money into renewables, and we're not talking about a hundred million over ten years. We're talking about billions of dollars which are being invested. Why is Exxon Mobil resisting the renewable revolution that is being embraced by other companies, even in the oil and gas sector? Our analysis is that we are not going to be able to meet the challenge that you would like to make, meet and I would like to meet with current generation. That is our assessment. We need to leapfrog current generation technology. We need to have breakthrough, world changing, and that is what the objective of our Global Climate and Energy Project is at Stanford University. We have 40 breakthrough programs underway looking at every aspect of renewables. We are looking at wind, we're, we're, I mean we solar, we are looking at biofuels, Mr. biomass. Simon, we don't have time, Mr. Simon. Okay? We have we've got people, you heard in my opening statement, for the poorest 20 percent in America, it is now 10 percent of their income going to paying their gasoline bill. So as, as these consumers are at the pump, being tipped upside down and having money shaken out of their pocket, your message to them is that you can't do anything for them, that you are about to begin a partnership to think about what you are going to do about a renewable energy agenda. And that is not going to send any message that we are going to put pressure on OPEC uh, that we are about to change business in our country. Well, if we are going to have the kind of impact that you and I want longer term is going to take breakthroughs, and that is what we are trying to do there. That does not say that we can't do something to try to address the price at the pump today. About 80 percent of that price, or 70 percent of that price, is crude oil. What can we do there? One thing, we can moderate demand in terms of the transportation sector. But you can't have it both ways, Mr. Simon. You can't, on the one hand, be nickel and diming uh, renewables at ExxonMobil and at the same time be recording $40 billion worth of profits and simultaneously fighting our efforts to move over the billions of dollars into the research in renewables, which this country needs to break its dependence upon imported oil. You cannot do that, Mr. Simon. Exxon should make a commitment that they are going to put 10 percent of their profits into renewables so that America has a comprehensive strategy to fight that dependence upon imported oil. Are you willing to make that kind of a commitment? Mr. Chairman, we continue to look at that area. If we identify an area where we think it can have the impact that you are alluding to, we will do that. But we have studied all forms, even anticipating some improvements. And the current technologies just do not have an impact of any kind of, of appreciable impact on this challenge that we are trying to meet. 
Mr. You Simon, know. that is just going to be a continuation of a policy of tax breaks for the oil companies and tough breaks for consumers at the pump. And that just doesn't work. OPEC has us over a barrel. And you're saying you're going to study the issue for another 10 years. And with all due respect to Stanford, you have competitors here on this panel who are already investing uh, in multi-billion dollar strategies in alternative energy. And I just think that it's time to move to this new agenda for the sake of our country and for the consuming uh, public uh, that really does feel uh, as they have been shortchanged in terms of protecting them against what looks like to be a devastating long-term prospect of paying $3.29, $4.29 and more at the pump for the indefinite future. Uh, my time has expired. I turn to recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things that I learned when I got to Congress is that we don't have the power here to repeal the law of supply and demand. Um, obviously, demand is up, particularly uh, as a result of uh, uh, the increased demand in emerging economies like China and India. Um, supply is restricted, partly due to the fact that we have not been able to build new refineries in this country to inc increase supplies to consumers. Uh, and then as a result of our low interest policy, which we need to prevent a complete collapse of the housing market, you see the value of the dollar uh, tanking on overseas markets. And uh, the OPEC nations who do sell us oil uh, aren't going to want to get paid in cheaper dollars. Now, all that on the table, and not too much we are able to do about it, either in Congress or on your side of the table. What do each of the five of you think is the single most important policy that Congress can make to increase supply and thus take the pinch off of higher prices? You can start, Mr. Simon. Well, Congressman, I don't think there is any silver bullet here. Or any well, we know that, but I am asking you to prioritize. And I have got three and a half minutes left, and you have got four colleagues that want to speak. To me, it would be to open access to supplies that are currently off limits. We have 31 billion barrels, 105 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. That is enough to power 10 million automobiles and heat 15 million uh, homes here in the United States for over 100 years. Okay, Mr. Hoffmeister. I think the, the Congress should look at short-term, medium-term and long-term solutions in a comprehensive strategy that would take into account everything from more access to the new and developing technologies of the future. If we don't look at it short term, medium term, long term, we will suffer enormously in the next several years from a shortage of, a continuing shortage of hydrocarbons. Mr. Robertson. There's a lot of things that the Congress can do. I think, uh, you know, starting to lead an efficiency um, message to the American people is the first most important thing. But after that, I think uh, we need access to all kinds of energy supplies, renewables and oil and gas. The single biggest thing, I think, would be to open up the 85 percent of the offshore uh, acreage in the United States that is currently unattainable. Mm -hmm. I think it is unrealistic to ask the rest of the world to open up their areas without us doing it the same ourselves. Mr. Lowell. Yes, we need to support all forms of energy, but particularly, as my colleagues have said, we need more access here in the United States. Mr. Malone. Uh, Congressman, access is number one, but I would al also emphasize the huge potential that sits north of us in Canada as we have the Saudi Arabia of North America sitting there ready to provide us with needed energy. Okay. Now, that all being said, I guess the common thread that I have heard from each of you is that we need more access. Um, and uh, you have all alluded to where the access is. If you got the access, would you have the refining capacity to be able to increase the supply to the consumer and thus at least take the pressure off of ever increasing uh, prices? We haven't built a new refinery in this country in 30 or 35 years. So if you have the access but you can't refine it, uh, how do you get the product to the consumers at uh, at least the same price, if not a lower price? Why don't we start with Mr. Malone? 
uh, access, for example, two of our projects are to expand our existing refineries with the use of access being allowed on, on Canadian heavy crude. Both of those, that will result in something like 2.2 to 2.5 million gallons a day more gasoline. So physically, we can expand our refineries, which we have been doing for years. Mr. Lowe. Yes, we are spending billions of dollars to expand not only the capacity of our refineries, but also the capability of our refineries to run these heavier crudes. Uh, but we have encountered significant difficulties. Even though we are trying to increase capacity and produce cleaner fuels, we have encountered significant difficulty in, in permitting these projects. Mr. Robertson. Uh, the U.S. use of oil in the last few years has been about flat. So if we produced more oil and gas, and if we produced more oil and gas in the United States, we would have to import less. We have the refining capacity in the United States to deal with the market today, I think. So I think the issue is around if you produce more oil in the United States, more on the world market, prices directionally are lower, we import less. We can Mr. Take Hoffmeister. I mentioned the $7 billion investment that is currently ongoing in Port Arthur, Texas. This will more than double the size of a refinery and take it to over 600,000 barrels a day, one of the world's largest. I think we have the refining capacity to meet future demand. My time is up, but can I ask Mr. Simon to put his two cents Please. worth in? We are, uh, have expanded our capacity at a rate 50 percent higher than industry. We do not think we will have any issues in terms of continuing to expand our existing capacity sufficient to meet demand in the future. Thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, make a request, Mr. Simon, if not now, but because you wouldn't have time to explain it and I'd like to see it on paper, if you could just explain, uh, have someone submit to the committee the accounting uh, assumptions that are used to explain uh, how you pay more in taxes than you earn in the United States. What assumptions you are making about downstream business versus upstream profits overseas would be very useful for me. I appreciate the couple of references that were made to the de demand side of the equation. Mr. Hoffmeister, I don't think you got to it in your testimony on page 9, but you <laughs> talked about land use and uh, demand management and how people use the automobile, uh, notions about some very specific things that we need to think about in terms of 17 boutique uh, few. I mean, these are, these are important things for us to hear. But there are two points, I guess, that I would like to just zero in on. Uh, there are implications here that if we just opened up all our sensitive areas to uh, oil exploration, that somehow we wouldn't be in the fix that we are in today. But your testimony referenced the fact that we are 5 percent of the world's population with 3 percent of the world's uh, proven reserves, and we are consuming 25 percent of the world's oil supply. Do any of you think, any, any circumstance, that we wouldn't be in a serious situation today, uh, given those facts, and that we are going to need to change it in the future? Anybody think this is sustainable? Well, I think in my testimony, I think I said it is not sustainable. I mean, do, I, I, I want to clarify, does anybody think the current situation is sustainable? Well, I, Thank you. I certainly feel that we are going to be able to meet increased requirements given the access and given the opportunity to do so. Yeah. Which is different than the current situation of being sustainable uh, with 25 percent. Is there any reason that any of you think that American technology, conservation, demand management, that over the next 10 or 15 years we can at least come close to what other countries are doing in Western Europe, in Japan? Is there any reason we can't come close to to reducing our in per capita energy utilization over the next 10 or 15 years with those mechanisms? I think, we can do, I, th I think we can do an awful lot on demand management. I think I said that was the most important thing that we can do. But we, we can we catch up with the Japanese and yes. the Europeans over the next 10 or 15 yes. years? On, I think absolutely. We have, we have a company called Chevron Energy Solutions that uh, delivers energy efficiency services to mm -hmm. other, other public agencies yeah. and to companies. They have done 800 projects over the last few years. Many of them involve putting in solar panels, putting in fuel cells, putting in whatever it takes that particular facility to reduce their energy use. Their Mr. Robertson, that's, and that's, uh, I appreciate your clarification. I think that's very important. I, I appreciated what a number of you said in terms of diversifying into being truly global energy companies. 
But they're now, I'd like to, if I'd like, and, and the energy cost is 30 percent on average yeah. of the places they've been. Yeah. What I would like to do is just with my remaining seconds is to clarify on the last point, because you are, some of you more aggressively than others, understand that the future is uh, going to be weighted in significant ways towards renewable energies, towards solar, towards, uh, some of you are doing geothermal now, uh, biofuels, uh, wind. Uh, is there I'm curious at what point the mature part of your business, the oil produce, production, which didn't even have uh, the manufacturing uh, benefit up until 2004, at what point it's mature enough that we can focus the subsidy on areas of the emerging energy business, and in fact many of you are involved with, that appear to need it more, like wind, and like solar. At what point do we make that switch over? I think in the first instance, Congressman, your time frame of 10 to 15 years is too short. I think there is too much to be done to change behaviors, technology, and to refleet America, so to speak. We don't have the benefits of the, the, the dense housing that exists in other parts of the world. So we have long commutes. We don't have the benefits of mass transit systems. But coming to your more recent question, I think that uh, the issue that is most troubling in terms of the 199 withdrawal is the fact that the Congress is punishing five companies by name. I think that there is My a. My point is at what point do you no longer need it and it can be shifted to areas that do? Well, that, that is, you know, we are mature already. We are successful as a company. I testified two years ago that we are not asking and for And wind incentive. and solar is not yet as mature? Wind and solar have lots of obstacles to overcome, even though we are investing today and moving as rapidly as we can. There is not enough turbine manufacturing. There are not enough transmission lines to make wind viable uh, in terms of uh, rapid growth. Thank you. I see my time has expired. I, I appreciate your clarification. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence. I guess my only concern is that we ought to be serious about taking this as something in terms of the time frame being too, too long. I think 10 to 15 years may be actually that we don't have that much time as gasoline goes to 5 and $10 a gallon, as supply becomes more tenuous, as uh, the global warming reality sets in. And I, I suspect with your help uh, and with a couple of reauthorization bills and a national strategy for infrastructure, I think we could put these pieces together sooner. I don't know that we have a choice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, uh, this is a hearing structured to uh, deliver a fair amount of criticism to you. It seems Congress is good at that, not necessarily good at pointing a finger at itself. I want to ask you about a policy that this Congress enacted, which I think deserves some criticism itself. It is my understanding uh, that as a result of a loophole in the U.S. tax code, uh, we have created a policy now recognized as splash and dash where uh, we created an incentive to produce biodiesel and enacted policies which provide that if you add as little as one gallon of biodiesel to 99 gallons of uh, diesel produced by uh, uh, standard means, uh, the US, and then you export that fuel, the U.S. government will provide you a dollar a gallon subsidy. This has become known as splash and dash. Uh, it has cost the American taxpayers, I believe, $30 million. Several attempts have been made to repeal this uh, by the Congress in the last few years. None have done so. I understand Senator Schumer uh, is working on a repeal. I would like to just begin by asking each of you if you are familiar with that uh, and if you think there is any justification for that kind of a waste of American taxpayer dollars. Congressman, our position is that we do not need and should not have incentives to encourage us in the renewables area. If there is an opportunity there and it will make sense, it ought to stand on its own and free enterprise will go after it. Are any of you aware of this splash and dash practice where uh, yes, biodiesel is added? Yes, sir. Mr. I'm Robertson? I am aware of it. I think you characterized it probably right. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we haven't taken advantage of it and don't need it. My characterization is quite accurate then? It is pretty accurate, yeah. And it is costing the American taxpayers as a result of the subsidy. And as I understand it, the diesel fuel is actually then being exported 
That's so the I, I don't know. I can't confirm the number that you said in terms of the millions of dollars, but I think your characterization of it as a, a way to export and take advantage of a credit is right. I certainly hope that that kind of a loophole can be closed very quickly and that it makes no sense for us to be uh, subsidizing foreign use of uh, our diesel fuel uh, to encourage the production of biofuels here in the United States. And it is my understanding that it has that economic impact. It is a dollar per gallon uh, by simply adding one gallon of biodiesel to uh, 99 gallons of uh, regular diesel. Um, uh, Mr. Simon, can you tell me what percentage of the world's 10 biggest oil companies or natural gas companies are owned or operated by foreign governments? Uh, well, if you look at the, uh, the top uh, companies, only about two of the top 13, as I recall, are national oil companies and the rest of them are international oil companies. And do you know what percentage of the world's proven oil reserves U.S. oil companies control? Well, I know what it is in terms of national oil companies. It's about six percent, and then the, uh, I mean, and then the, uh, I'm sorry, the international companies is six percent. National oil companies is about eighty percent. Mr. Hoffmeister, you testified that uh, U.S. oil production has declined. I believe you said over the last, I'm not sure if you said decade. Uh, while our demand has gone up, our production has gone down. Uh, Mr. Robertson, you explained that uh, we have enacted. Uh, increasing policies to restrict access to uh, fuel supplies here, and you expressed concern about the rest of the world being asked to produce more energy supplies while we are restricting access to energy supplies here. Um, one of my colleagues up here said, well, uh, perhaps you were suggesting that the answer is that we be allowed to drill in every sensitive area. I suspect there are areas that, that are less sensitive than others, and I suspect that, uh, or I would like to know, it, is there a correlation between the number of areas that have been reserved or locked off over the last decade and the decline in production? And are there areas that you could point to where we could be exploring, either of you or any of you, where we could be exploring for reserves or using reserves that are there uh, to increase production here in the United States without doing environmental damage? Well, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that I would point out is that the offshore, most of the offshore in the United States has not been looked at with modern technology in many, many, many years. It was really 1980s and 1970s technology, seismic technology that looked at that. So the first thing that I think would make sense to do, and the government, frankly, could do this, is sponsor a seismic survey of the offshore of the entire continental shelf of the United States. And then at least you would be talking about facts. You would know what was perspective and what wasn't perspective. You could look at the areas that were environmentally sensitive and the areas that aren't environmentally sensitive. And you could zero in and be debating on real information as opposed to worrying about the whole offshore because it is pretty clear there are going to be some areas that are perspective for drilling and there are going to be some areas that aren't. So at least you could narrow the playing field, it seems to me, fairly dramatically and figure out where the likelihood of America's opportunity is. And do you believe that is substantial? I believe it is substan very substantial, yes. Mr. Hoffmeister? Absolutely. I think knowing what we know from past surveys, I think the API estimates there is more than 100 billion barrels of reserves that are not coming from what you might, some people might term sensitive areas. These are outer continental shelf deposits that have been there for geological ages. And not having had access for some 30 years, we have seen this steady increase in imports and steady decline in American production. We have geared our exploration and production to around the world rather than the United States. I thank you for your testimony. I assume technology has improved in that 30 years in terms of protecting the environment. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, we need to say something good about the industry here. One point of this, of this hearing, I want to congratulate uh, BP for meeting their Kyoto CO2 reduction targets of their internal operations within, I think, three or four years, showing that this can be done. It is a good example for the rest of us. I want to ask, uh, to, this is a question to all of you, did you or any of your associates participate in the secret uh, Vice President Dick Cheney Energy Task Force in 2001? We did not. I testified previously. The answer is no. No. Yes. And would you, uh, Mr. Wall, could you make your documents related to that, to that secret uh, meetings available to the committee? Um, yes, sir. Thank you. We, we would make that request. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Simon, listening to your testimony makes me even more convinced that we need to act to create an incentive for decision makers and in industry to really make real investments in the clean energy revolution rather than relatively small ones. 
And the reason I say that is that listening to you, as far as I can tell, you are spending less than half a percent of your gross revenues on clean energy re research. Is that right? It would be a very modest amount. I would acknowledge that. But I would not acknowledge that we are not doing a lot to address greenhouse gas emissions. Well, considering that we have to cut our greenhouse gas emissions 80 percent in this country below our levels by 2050, would you agree that if your company continues on its present course, it will fall uh, several hundred orders of magnitude short of what we have to do to prevent cataclysmic global climate change? Well, the assumption there that that is required in order to do that. I well, how is this going to happen? I mean, oil isn't going to all of a sudden become clean. We need to do the research to figure out these technologies. No, but, but the fact is that we are going to have oil and gas and coal, and it is going to constitute about 80 percent of the energy equation. With that as a given, how do we then address and do what we can to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions with that being the case? Would you agree with me, sir, that if Exxon continues on its present course, of having less than one half of one percent of its revenues associated with clean energy sources other than oil and gas, that the world is going to suffer significantly unless Exxon and its like changes its behavior. No, I don't agree with that. And I think we can do a lot more in terms of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions by focusing on the areas that we are. So where are these? Transportation, wh uh, efficiency improvements for being one. So where are these new, if you don't put research dollars into it, is it going to come from the, you know, the, the oil ferry somehow these new technologies are going to show up? Nope. We've got to put some real money in this, don't we? Given the fact that, again, we have got oil and it is in our equation and it is going to be a significant factor, we are focusing on how do we make the use of that oil much more efficient. Well, let me suggest, I, I hope that you will go take from this hearing a uh, 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 a much more optimistic viewpoint of our capability. You mentioned the money you are putting into Stanford. I was at Stanford last weekend talking to their scientists, and I was very excited by going over a report called A Renewable Energy Solution to Global Warming, presented by Mark Jacobson, Atmospheric Energy Program, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Stanford University. And what they concluded, and I will just read you a couple sentences in the summary. The U.S. could replace all on-road vehicles with battery electric vehicles powered by 71,000 to 122,000 5-megawatt wind turbines, less than the 300,000 airplanes the U.S. produced during World War II. Wind battery electric vehicles could reduce U.S. carbon dioxide by 25.5 percent. Solar battery electric vehicles can reduce it by 23.4 percent. Now, would you agree to me that this is a vision from Stanford, the folks that you are giving some money to, is one that the United States really needs and that with your pathetically small research budget, we are not going to meet unless something changes? No, I don't agree with that, Congressman. And I would invite you to go look for yourself at what we are doing in the Global Climate and Energy Project. I think you would find it to be quite significant. It has long-term, very significant impacts in terms of what it can do on the energy equation and greenhouse gas mitigation. We actually did ask your company to give us the investments they were making in this, and you refused to give it to us. But you have helped us by telling it is less than one half percent. Now, I can tell you that there is a lot of constituents that think that that is an inadequate contribution to the future of the planet Earth, and I just hope things change. And obviously, we got to change them by changing this tax policy. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have to ask this question because I know if my constituents were here, they would ask it. With your record high profits, have you thought of lowering the price of gasoline with any of that? I mean, I, I was a small business owner for 21 years. There is that margin where you don't have to charge quite as much if you are making a profit. Could I, just, could I say something in favor of profits? Profits are what enable capital investments I, to increase the supply. You are talking to a capitalist. I Lower, lowering our prices happens in many markets based upon local supply and demand. The prices go up, the prices go down. These prices are set at the street level in the local marketplaces where they, where they come from. The global price of crude, however, is the real issue. That is the real problem in the cost of gasoline. And the global price of crude will not go down unless the supply increases. Well, I, the, or the demand goes down. 
And that is what I fear is happening in our country today, is not that the demand is going down because of conservation. The demand is going down because our economy is taking a big hit. And people are having to make some really tough choices. You have got the independent truckers today that are boycotting or striking to send a message. I mean, we are at a, a very, very precipitate, a very, very perilous time in our economy right now. I'm, I'm not against profits, don't get me wrong. I've, again, I'm a small business owner for 21 years. I understand that is important to make the next set of capital investments. I also understand the reinvestment can come to helping your consumers once in a while, too, in terms of price where that is appropriate. Mr. Robertson, I have a question for you regarding ethanol. I understand that, that Chevron blends about 40 percent of its uh, or 40 percent uh, of gasoline that you sell in the United States has ethanol in it. Can you speak to us about volatility in price that is specifically and documented related to ethanol and that mix? Is that driving gas up or not? I think ethanol prices have gone, I mean, have been pretty erratic here in the last uh, couple of years. And they have, uh, you know, they were. Is your mic on, sir? I'm so, yeah, it is, yeah. Okay. Closer. Eth ethanol prices have, uh, have been pretty volatile over the last yeah. couple of years. But I think it is a very small part, frankly, of the price of gasoline. I think it has been already testified, you know, 70 percent of the price of gasoline is crude oil, okay. uh, 15 percent of the price of gasoline is taxes. So the balance, in fact, if you take today $100 oil and, you know, 42 gallons of 250, 250 a gallon is oil, is crude oil, okay. add 40 cents for taxes, $2.90, there isn't much left. So I think, frankly, even, even though ethanol is about 5 okay. percent of our gasoline, that volatility hasn't had much of an effect. Okay. On the I appreciate price. that. I, I used to chair the Forestry Subcommittee and, and have been very interested in your partnership with Weyerhaeuser in terms of biofuels. And I know my colleague from South Dakota and I have both been real interested in trying to correct a wrong in the, uh, in the energy bill that passed that said woody biomass off Federal forest lands or unless it is grown specifically for biomass doesn't count toward a renewable fuel standard, which seems sort of bizarre. Um, if we are serious about getting to the next generation of fuels. Can you talk to us about any breakthroughs you are seeing on cellulosic development where we can turn woody biomass into a fuel we can burn in our vehicles at an economic rate? You know, I don't think I can tell you much about any new breaks. I mean, the, the JV with Weyerhaeuser is relatively new, although it's, we've been talking, working with them for about a year. Right. Uh, the, the, the thing that is important is they have got a huge amount of forestry, obviously, and timberland in the United States. Right. We, got an, we got and a lot of knowledge on chemistry of, of, uh, of forest products. We got a lot of knowledge on fuels and the chemistry of fuels. And we are pretty convinced that working together we can come up with, uh, you know, uh, something that we can create, uh, make into a commercial scale a project. But at the moment it is really about technology and about trying to find the breakthrough. We have also got uh, a whole series of uh, partnerships with universities, one in Georgia Tech, uh, which deals with forest products, one in UC California Davis, because they have got different kind of agricultural projects there, one in Texas. So different places trying different kinds of feedstocks. But I can't report any breakthroughs okay. yet. It is not that the science doesn't work, it is the scale. It is scaling right. it up. We have got the science in lots of places. We just I, I think it holds great, great promise, indeed. Yeah, I think it's great promise. Mr. Malone, while you are here, I also serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, and we did some oversight hearings on your pipe issue up in Alaska. Can you give us an update on security of that piping system up there? Thank you, Congressman. I remember the hearings well. Um, yes, uh, excellent progress. Uh, as you know, we said we would have it done in two years. Um, and because we, we have to do it during the winter season, the, uh, uh, with our partners, these, the lines have now been replaced. Uh, we're finishing up the last bit of it. We will be done on schedule, maybe even ahead of time. We actually have oil flowing through the n one section of the new transit line. And the last time I was in Alaska, there was a discussion about the end of the Prudhoe Bay oil because of the amount it takes to come down the pipeline may get to a point where it's just not adequate. To, to flow. Can you give us an update on the status of that and the effect of the market when that happens? Well, the, f first of all, there's lots of opportunities. Again, there's uh, several of us producing up there. But from our perspective, we see a 50 year future if we're able to move into some of the heavier oils and also the infield enhancements that we have. We, we originally thought we'd recover somewhere around 25, 30 percent of the oil. This field has the potential to actually recover 65 percent. So right now we are working as hard as we can to continue the flow from Prudhoe Bay. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank all the witnesses as well for your, for your testimony. I am going to make an, an assumption. I think it is uh, pretty broad but pretty clear that your primary responsibility, your primary fiduciary responsibility is to the shareholders 
of your companies. And when you make decisions uh, based in the free enterprise system and in the marketplace, it is based on results for that shareholders. Is that a fair assumption? Is there anyone who would disagree with that? And when we make decisions, and uh, a lot of our decisions are policy decisions based on the citizens that were, were sworn to serve. And there was a lot of testimony, and uh, very productive testimony, and thank you for that. Uh, but I want to get back to this whole issue of supply and, and demand, because the, uh, in my district, the independent uh, Connecticut Petroleum Dealers Association is saying that whole system has gone amok. Uh, the laws of supply and demand are not operating on the street, as you were alluding to, Mr. Hoffmeister. I understand in general uh, what you are saying, but in the instance of, of particularly of oil and gas, we have seen this speculation. We see people that do not either receive or store oil, but are pushing paper forward uh, and causing the artificial rise in price of oil. Do you agree with the Independent Petroleum Council, or are they way off base here? Start with Mr. Simon. We will go right down the line. When you look at the fundamentals of our business, Congressman, the supply-demand fundamentals, our assessment would be the price should be somewhere around $50, $55 a barrel. There is a disconnect. To me, there are three factors that contribute to that. One is the monetary issue of the weaker dollars we have already talked about. The other is geopolitical risk, and the third, we believe, is speculation. And you could probably break that into three parts, and it's about 30 to 40 percent of each. Well, most of you agree with that assessment, or would you alter your assessment? Most of you would agree with those three factors. I would agree with those three factors. What would you do about the speculators? The dollar is part of it as well. Okay. What would you do about the speculators? What would I do about that? I mean, how do we get a, I how do we get rid of the Jim Fisks and Jay Goulds of the uh, crude oil? Uh, how do we how do we uh, how do we stop this artificial fluctuation of, uh, of prices? Well, I agree with uh, uh, what was just said, that the main things that I think are driving the price of oil are the huge demand in the world, uh, the reduction in spare capacity in the world, the price of the dollar. Because of the economy, we have just witnessed that the that demand is lessening here. Hopefully through conservation, demand will lessen as well. And yet, we see we are part of a world system. And, and the, the demand we are part of a world system. But, but here, in, here, in the, here in this country, we are responsible to our, our citizens. And how do we say, as I said at the outset, how do you turn to the lady who has to turn over an entire Social Security check to pay for a royal bill? Well, that the laws of supply and demand are in effect? How do we deal with the fact that people can, in this system, manipulate the price in such a manner that even through all of your good efforts, and then it has us saying to you in turn, hey, what do you need that tax cut? What are we spending? What are we giving you a tax break of $107 billion for? People at Augie and Ray's were in my hometown are asking that very question. But we've, cho we've, chosen to, we've chosen by our policy to be dependent on oil from overseas. That is our choice. We chose not to develop our own resources in this country. That was our choice. And the fact of the matter is we are, we are part of the world. We are part of the growing demand in the world. And we, we well, as long as it is more profitable, what incentive is there for you to develop alternatives as long as it is profitable and you are able to get the rates that you are currently able to get? And if you are sworn as a fiduciary responsibility to provide the greatest return for your shareholder, uh, geez, I don't know. Well, but it seems to me like, hey, if I was one of your shareholders, they are saying, you know, they are not doing a bad job. I am getting a pretty good yield on my dollar here. But if I am a citizen of this country, I am saying, we are not making out so well here. Our, our shareholders only get a return if the customers are, are being satisfied with the product. If we, don't, if we don't sell a product that our customers want, then our shareholders are going to lose. This is a matter of customers not, they don't have a choice here. When it is between heating your home or freezing to death, that is not much of a choice. You know, when it comes down to whether or not you are able to get back and forth to work, that is not much of a choice. It is what my grandfather says, trust everyone but cut the cards. And somewhere in here there is a disconnect. We need your help in uh, trying to fix this dis disconnect. Mr. Stupak, who was here, who left, also has proposals that are talking about the manipulation of the market. Uh, I guess we're, we're doing our damnedest to fix this. We're spending as much money as our company can with the human people that we have and the infrastructure that exists. We're spending as much as we can to produce energy for the people in this country and the people in the world. 
We I, don't know how to do it. My time is up, but I'd be interested if you, all of you could, in, in writing, I'd love to hear your uh, opinions on whether what you would do to the speculative side of this market that distorts the entire market and your integrity as well. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I did mention in my opening statement, and I would then uh, agree with uh, some of the comments that have been made by some of our witnesses here, that uh, we have made a choice as a nation, unfortunately, in my estimation, uh, not to advantage ourselves of much of our uh, uh, own uh, energy supplies, and uh, that is to our own disadvantage, I think. Uh, but, however, we have made that choice as a nation. But as been mentioned, we are in the, in the global market for energy. And so my first question would be in regards to uh, supply. And uh, being from Michigan, a border state, uh, we uh, look across to our wonderful uh, neighbors in Canada and we see all the oil sands that are there. One of you mentioned about the oil sands. Uh, I am just wondering, what is the actual percentage of uh, our foreign supply uh, that we get to the United States actually comes from Canada now? Uh, and in regards to the oil sand, uh, could any of you tell me generally what you think the potential might be there for an increase in the supply uh, to us from Canada? Uh, and I also have an interest, I mean, I have heard, for instance, that China is up there uh, trying to lock down as a contract for as much as they can uh, of the oil sands. And then also in regards to the uh, uh, process of refining, I believe it is Shell uh, that is going to be uh, about uh, 20 miles from my, uh, my district, actually, on the Canadian side, who is building a uh, very large refinery for the oil sands, the Canadian oil sands. I am not sure who I am directing this to. <clears throat> Mr. Lowe. Uh, ConocoPhillips is the largest landholder in the Canadian oil sands, and we have a number of different projects. Is your microphone on, Mr. Lowe? Yes, sorry. <coughs> if you can move in a little bit closer, please. ConocoPhillips is the largest landholder in the Canadian oil sands. We have a number of, of, of very good projects, each uh, multi billion dollar projects that we are advancing, and we believe that ultimately uh, the Canadian oil sands can, can supply about 20 percent of the U.S.'s oil needs. Uh, but we are going to have to develop our refining uh, infrastructure and our pipeline infrastructure to make sure we can get that crude into our refineries and make sure our refineries can process the, the heavier crude. Twenty percent. What is it current, currently? How much? What is approximately currently percentage? It is relatively small. I see. Well, the, the, the I will make a comment. The, the U.S. Yes. Uh, uses about 20, a little over 20 million barrels a day of oil. Today there is about 2.5 million barrels a day of oil comes from Canada. So there, our largest, our largest importer, our largest imports of oil come from Canada. Our second largest come from Mexico. But the the uh, the oil sands, as was described, could pro potentially be two or three million barrels a day, or maybe maybe higher than that. So they could double the uh, input from, uh, from Canada and be uh, 10 percent or. 15 or 20 percent of U.S. demand. So, when do you th see that happening? I mean, what it's, it's time frame? Two years? No, 100 no, years? 10, 15, 20 years. I see. Mr. Malone, it's going to build up over time. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, you know we have two Midwest refineries, one in Indiana, one in Ohio, that uh, through either uh, joint ventures now or through supply agreements, we're going to expand both those refineries to take on a significant, essentially he completely heavy Canadian crude. And if we did that uh, for the Midwest, again, the, including your state, it's, uh, it's somewhere in the area of 2.6 million gallons more a day. So the supply is there. I and think a point should be made that the oil sands are successful because of a national energy strategy that was developed by our neighbor to the north. Uh, we have the same opportunity in this country to develop a national energy strategy. The United States is blessed with more than a trillion barrels of potentially recoverable resource in the oil shale of Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Uh, we have, Shell has been in that region for more than 20 years, testing, experimenting, environmentally sound ways to potentially extract that resource. And we do not see support coming forward to make that a reality in terms of national policy, and it might be something for Congress to consider. Congress doesn't always do well on national policy. And Mr. Hoffmeister, I know in your testimony you said uh, you applauded the uh, higher CAFE standards. For the domestic auto industry, uh, my, my, my personal observation is uh, we are going to end up bankrupting the domestic auto industry because of the mandates that we put on it. But I appreciate what you what you've said there. Is there uh, any of the, I only have 30 seconds left, what about China? We keep hearing about China up there contracting for the oil sands. Is anybody have any comment on that and uh, what is happening there that would might shut us out of the supply? 
I don't see that kind of shut us out of the supply. I mean, China is just like, in many ways, just like the United States. They're competing in the world for energy supplies. We're competing with them. They're, they're investing in projects around the world just like we are. They're investing in Canadian projects just like we are. But I don't think there's any shut out of, uh, of oil in Canada. In fact, most of the oil in Canada most likely is going to come south to the United States. I, I would agree with that. I think we also have to be careful about passing legislation here that would cut us off from that supply of heavy uh, tar sands and uh, heavy oil from Canada, which I think is a real issue that Congress needs to address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Big gentle ladies, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I'm going to try to ask short questions and, and so I can get short qu uh, answers in my time. M my, uh, my father uh, worked all of his life. He um, never earned more than $25,000 a year. And, and there were years that he worked, actually worked three jobs, uh, most of the time just to send four, four children to college. He's 86 years old. Uh, there will be people like my father all over the country, and, and I'll have some of them uh, at a meeting next Saturday when I do my monthly coffee with the congressman. Mr. Simon, what can I say to them to help them understand how Lee Raymond received a $400 million uh, severance package from ExxonMobil, which translates into $141,000 a day. What do, what do I say next Saturday to the people who come to my, uh, who, my meeting who are struggling to get to work now because they can't afford to put gasoline in their car? Can you help me get them to understand how it's okay for Mr. Uh, Raymond to get a $400 million package and they struggle uh, and the oil company profits are at an all-time high? Well, I would hope that would be behind us by now, Congressman, but I would just Why? point out, as we have said before, Why? because that, that is in the past. It hasn't been here recently. But what well, I the gas pro every, yeah, we can only talk about gas prices uh, from yesterday. I mean, everything we talk about here is in the past. Well, I agree, but yesterday is a lot different than, let's say, when, uh, when that occurred. But I believe, as we testified before, when you break down that, I think there was a misconception of how much of that was due to past, how much it would do with the future, and how much it was due to current earnings there. And I think it was blown out of proportion. So you think I should tell people in my district and probably all over the country that $400 million package was blown out of proportion? I think when you look at it, uh, Congressman, and you break it down, and you look at that pay package relative to others that were doing the same kind of jobs, you would, you would consider it competitive. And it was done by outside directors. There was not management involved in that at all. And they look at others to make sure we're competitive. This is a rhetorical question. Whatever happened to shame? Uh, look, since we are having difficulty uh, um, get providing access that I think all of you agreed uh, that we need. Uh, are, are, are any of you right now uh, going back to uh, oil wells that were uh, tapped out or deemed to be uh, somewhat unprofitable when oil was sold at a, at a far less price? I mean, are, are any of you now unplugging or uh, upgrading old wells? Well, we're, cer we're certainly going back to facilities that, uh, you know, maybe oil fields that are producing and, and looking at the opportunity to put more technology into those oil fields and more ways to extract more from, uh, from those wells. So, example, in the, in the San Joaquin Valley in California where we have a, uh, a big uh, field, that field's now been producing for 100 years. It's likely to get up to, uh, originally we probably thought we'd be able to recover 10 or 20 percent of the oil that's in that field. Today we're looking at ways to get up to 80 percent. So more technology. Higher prices obviously lead to the opportunity to put more money and more technology into existing fields and can make them last a lot longer and make them increase the production. So in that sense, yes. Some, you, we could get the impression that the oil industry is struggling. I mean, if, if you listen, it, it's, you don't think it's struggling. I think we struggle for access, Congressman. We struggle for access in which we can have uh, appropriate investments that are making the return on that investment worthwhile. In other words, we are looking for the ample reserves. Uh, we, we could spend an awful lot more money with very low return uh, if, if we were looking in the old fields 
in which a lot of that oil has already been extracted. I agree with my colleague that there, were, there are wonderful technical opportunities to get more from existing fields, but until the Nation has a means by which we could use, for example, CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in the large quantities that would be necessary, many of these old fields will not have the, 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 the ability to produce a lot more oil. Your, all, all of your companies are, are, are doing well, right? Well, we're, we're working darn hard. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got a big challenge to meet. We've got a, the, the world, and including this country, that needs a lot of energy, and we're spending and putting more human energy into, into these uh, investments, into these projects than we ever have before. Mm -hmm. So life is not easy. Well, your, your stock ended yesterday at 85.13. Uh, 85 right. I, I think uh, Exxon was 85.45, closed out yesterday. That doesn't sound much like a struggle. I didn't say it was a struggle. I said we were working hard to, to try and solve a problem that exists. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Problem. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks again for being here. Um, I, I believe that global warming is occurring. I think that man has something to do with it that doesn't have everything to do with it, but has a part to play in this. And we want to see a reduction in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as we go forward in the future. And I'm trying to kind of boil down what everyone here has said in, in, in my mind. And what I think you're basically saying, and, and I, I want to see if this is a true statement, is that you believe that we want to uh, spur domestic production, looking at other areas to drill in and, or explore in and for gas and oil, mainly to displace the, the uh, oil and gas we get from other countries. Uh, you said, I think Mr. Hoffmeister said, or one of you said that, 80 percent of these, these reserves are, are owned by uh, foreign companies, national companies. Is that, is that true? Is something like that? More than that. More than that. So really, uh, you guys collectively represent about, I guess, less than 10 percent of the global reserves? Chevron, um, Chevron is 0 0.6 percent of the global oil. Right, I thought it was more than that. Actually. We're, we're, Chevron is 0.6 percent of global oil and gas reserves. We're, it, we're 0.6. So really, it is a national security issue. We want to displace that. And you are saying that you are not opposed to moving towards a, into renewable fuels, into alternative fuels. You are doing research and development that. You want to move in that direction and get those uh, accomplished. But I think, Mr. Hoffmeister, again, you said that, and I am for that, too. I want to see us move away from gas and oil eventually in the future, you know, towards renewable fuels. I am for that. But we can't even do it immediately. I mean, in the short term, you said 15 to 20 years to develop this technology. And we need to do that. I guess my question is, I am for all these renewables, I am for alternative fuels, I think we need to move in that, but basically you are saying that oil and gas is still going to be very much a part of the equation as we move into this new, new frontier of, of alternative fuels, and you are willing, all of you are willing to do that. All of you think that is what we are trying to do? Is that, would that be a fair statement to say? I think it is important for the American people to understand the scale of what is going on in the U.S. economy. Uh, 10,000 gallons of gas, of oil a second is consumed in this country, 60 billion cubic feet of gas a day. If we stack those cubic feet on top of each other, it would be from here to the moon and back 25 times. 20 rail cars of coal are burned a minute in this country. This is every minute of every day and every second of every day. And so the scale of the massive amounts of hydrocarbons that are consumed to support the world's largest economy and one of the most creative and innovative economies is, is, is absolutely necessary. And the demand for electricity continues to rise across this country. We may see a dip in liquid fuel demand because of, of prices currently and, and, and other economic factors. But to be able to move to an alternative requires the technology to make it possible to make it commercial. What is slowing the movement to alternatives is the lack of commerciality yet. In other words, people aren't making a profit at it. People are investing in it, but they are not yet making a profit. As we get up larger scale, as we learn more up the maturity curve, I think we will make a lot of money in alternative and renewable energies, and the technology will be a, a propulsion engine for the nation's economy in the future. Congressman, I, I would want to support your, your comment. When you look at our outlook, if you look at the National Petroleum Council study, if you look at the IEA outlook, oil and gas will continue to represent the dominant source of energy, at least up through the year 2030. Mm -hmm. If you look at total fossil fuels, including coal, about 80 percent. That is where it is today. I think 
when you look at any outlook in terms of the impact of renewables, it's going to be very, very small, down in the 2 percent, 3 percent range. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm from Oklahoma, and I remember when I was in college in the 80s, I, I remember a lot, a lot of people were petroleum land management, and all, they got out of it. Um, I know that I've seen, and I have seen people lose jobs, I've seen people get out of this industry, uh, it, I've seen it hurt my community uh, uh, by people that, that downturn by low uh, oil prices. I remember it was $9 a barrel, $16 a barrel. People panicked. Our state, you know, weren't getting the revenues that they needed. Um, so you guys, you guys are making record profits right now, but have you ever lost money? You've lost money too. Is that true? Is that be a true statement? You've lost money. Yeah, I, I mean, I was there and head of our North American division and. Uh, 1999, when we closed the books and our earnings were zero. Well, how does your uh, in North America? How, how does your um, inve equity investment uh, rate of return compare to other industries, for example? How, have you ever done any analysis on that? Well, our, uh, as was I think already said, our, our, uh, our profits per dollar of sales, which is a typical way of looking at across industries, is, is about 8.3 cents per dollar of sales. The average for the U.S. is 7.8. And another thing, if I could mention. How many people domestically do each one of you employ? And do you offer retirement benefits and in health insurance? So Shell, we have about 250,000 people who have jobs because of Shell every day in America. We have about 25,000 working directly for Shell, but in our gas stations, our Jiffy Lube stores, tens of thousands of additional people work. We have 27,000 on Chevron employees in the United States. The average worker is, a salary worker is about $125,000 a year. The average hourly worker is about $75,000 a year. They all have pension plans and they all have health plans. Yeah. Anyone else? We have about 30 and I would echo what they said in terms of if you look at the pension plans and uh, the amount paid. So. 38,000 and a multiple of roughly four times contractors and support. Uh, multiple even higher than that, health care, pension plans. Uh, Congressman, the point I'd make is kind of one of the points you're making. When I started uh, work at Phillips Petroleum Company in 1981, we had over 9,000 employees in Bartlesville. We went through some rough times. Mm -hmm. By 1998, we were down to 2,000 employees in Bartlesville, and that was due to tough times. In the right. Thank you very much. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With varying degrees of emphasis, each of you have uh, indicated uh, that you have investments in renewable or energy efficient technology. What I would like to see is what your vision in the long term and the short term is of your company's um, makeup in uh, relation to oil versus uh, alternative new, new energy technologies, uh, starting with Mr. Robertson. Well, our, uh, you know, we are supportive of the data that was in the National Petroleum Council study that basically said that uh, in 2030, 85 percent of the world's energy would still come from coal, oil, and gas. So we, we think we're, we're probably in a fossil fuel environment for some time. We are spending something like uh, two and a half, we're going to spend two and a half billion dollars over the next uh, two years in the area of renewables and energy efficiency. And, and I think the biggest opportunity, and I, I, we've been talking a lot about supply here, and I know that, that uh, the biggest opportunity for us, frankly, I think, as a country and maybe as a world, is in energy efficiency and becoming more uh, y using energy more wisely. So, so I think that um, you know our, our, the evidence from our company that goes around doing these pro projects with public agencies is that we can get 30 percent reduction in use of energy from from, from <coughs> these projects. Our own evidence inside our company, we're now 27 percent more energy efficient than we were uh, 15 years ago. So, and, the, and the, most of that time, we were expecting oil to be $20 a barrel. <laughs> so the opportunity for us all to become a whole lot more energy efficient, and my, my, frankly, I still think the number one issue, yeah. the number one thing that the, and the Congress did some things in the last energy bill in terms of energy efficiency and appliance standards and those things, but I think in terms of leading the nation, leading the nation towards becoming a set of energy savers and becoming a, a con and this being a scarce resource, that's <laughs> the biggest source of energy as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. Um, Mr. Uh, Hofsmeyer, um, do you think that we've reached the maximum output possible of oil in historical terms? And if so, do you believe that the Alaska and offshore resources uh, would change that peak oil timing at all? I, I do not subscribe at all to peak oil theory. 
I, I think it is a theory that is based upon very narrow assumptions. I think if you look at the National Petroleum Council study, which has been referred to, or other studies around the world, the, mo the idea of moving from 80 million, 85 million barrels of production today, which we do, to somewhere near 110, 115 million barrels a day is in the focus of most international oil companies and do believe, and certainly Shell believes, that the world can produce significantly more oil than it does today, even while it focuses on other alternatives. So what is the bottleneck then? Why are we at a, a, a such a uh, logjam? I think that is an excellent question. I think there are bottlenecks around the world where, for example, within uh, nations that are oil exporting nations, where national oil companies dominate, access from international oil companies is limited in many cases. I think the United States is probably the world's best example of having lots of resources that are not permitted to be developed. And so we are not able to go into 85 percent of the Outer Continental Shelf, for example. So you don't think that the Hubbard's results uh, are accurate or reflect reality? In not at all, because in addition to what I have described in terms of what is out there, that, that assumption, may, those, that theory makes no, th no uh, remarks with respect to unconventional oil, such as oil sands or oil shale. What uh, do you think the makeup uh, of your company will be in terms of oil versus uh, other alternatives? Well, we were part and parcel of the National Petroleum Council study, as were other companies, and, and I, I subscribe to the, the uh, outcomes of that study that by 2030 we will spill, still be dominantly a hydrocarbon economy. All right. I am finished with my questions. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentle lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am tempted to ask for his extra time, but I won't. <laughs> I, I want to thank you all very much for being here. I am struck by the fact that you have mentioned many times that we have all made choices. Our nation has made choices when it comes to energy policy, and those choices have consequences. And I think that some unwise choices uh, 20, 30 years ago are yielding what we are seeing today. And we need to realize that sometimes um, a policy, we need to take a long-term view. And I appreciate that you all are willing to come here and sit down with us and begin to get our hands around this problem and get this thing solved. I want to just ask you one, uh, a couple of quick things, but I want to start with this. When a consumer buys a gallon of gas and they are paying their $3.29 at the pump, we know that 69 percent of that is going to crude. And if anybody disagrees with this, I want you to pipe up and, and tell me. We know that 13 percent of that is going for taxes and that 18 percent is there to cover refining, distribution cost, and marketing. So if does anyone disagree with those percentages and allowances? Okay. So would it be true that the government actually makes the most as a single entity out of a gallon of gas that they are realizing the most, Mr. Simon? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Because I, I think it is so interesting that that is where uh, a lot of the money goes and that is affecting what we are paying at, at the pump. Um, I want to come back to a, a point that was also made about comprehensive strategy because we have to find out how we are going to deal with this. And I am going to borrow from you, Mr. Hoffmeister. I think you are exactly right, short term, mid range, and long term. What I would like to hear from you is what you all are doing in each of those categories. And I am not going to ask for you to sit here and articulate anything right now, because we know some of the things that you are doing for alternatives and for future. I would like to have this in the form of just a one sheet when we are talking with individuals. You didn't cause all of this problem. Policy has caused part of this problem. You all may be partly to blame. The House and the Senate and the administration can all be partly to blame in this. The problem is we weren't looking far enough down the road early enough to address it. And as I said, that should have been a few years back. We do need to work on something that is a comprehensive strategy for this, this country that is going to consider supply, demand, that takes into account a global mar marketplace, takes into account 
that you all are dealing with companies that are owned by governments that are not independently owned. So I'm going to ask you all to submit that to us, what you are doing that you think will give us the greatest impact in the short term. Where your mid-range focus is, is we look toward 2030. And we look toward our fossil fuel needs moving toward 2030. What you're doing there, the policies that would, would help us with that. And then long term, uh, the policies and the actions we can take that create the environment for you to do your best. I would like to hear that. And then my last question that I wanted to touch on, um, windfall profits tax. Uh, like the ones that were proposed last year, how would that uh, affect your bottom line and what would it do to fuel prices? Mr. Malone, I'll start with you and let's just work down the line. Well, you, we're investing dollar for dollar in this country. So you take a dollar more in taxes, it's going to be a dollar left available for investment. Very good. Mr. Lowe? Yes, yeah, same for us. It just same. Uh, reduces the amount of supply. Okay. I, I think what this committee is after is increasing the supply of energy, not reducing it. I think that would reduce it. Okay. I think windfall profits were tried before, and it, would, it has resulted in some of what the problem is we face today, lack of supply. And I, I would also say we're dollar for dollar in the United States. Okay. Mr. Simon? I would say the same. Uh, the policy, if you tax something, you're going to get less of it. Okay. And Mr. Simon, I want to clarify one thing in your uh, testimony. You said from 03 to 07, your earnings grew by 89 percent, but your income taxes grew by 170 percent. Over the last five years, ExxonMobil's U.S. total tax bill exceeded your U.S. earnings by $19 billion. That's correct. That is correct. That's okay, correct. thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the General Lady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you. Um, I have been listening attentively to uh, many of your statements regarding uh, different investments that you all have made. And I want to uh, particularly commend uh, BP. Uh, Mr. Malone, because I had an opportunity on a, on a visit with this select committee. Uh, we visited uh, the Chancellor uh, Merkel and some folks, some business folks out there and had a very extensive discussion with your representative about solar panels and investments here in, in the United States and collaboratives that you have with uh, universities. Um, and it seems to me that you made an investment a long time ago, maybe a decade ago, that you were going to address this issue of uh, Green, green gases and, and how CO2 is affecting our entire environment. I, I fail to understand why your other colleagues haven't been able to maybe come up to speed uh, in, in that same vein. And I wonder, um, you know, what, what led you then to make those kinds of decisions, to make those investments, because you are a global market. Um, obviously, your uh, tentacles are everywhere, um, but especially in the EU. And because there are dramatic changes occurring there with governments, I think that has, in my opinion, uh, given you the impetus to do more. So uh, if, if, we could, if you could just touch on that, because what, what I'm trying to sense here is that we're not doing enough to create an incentive so that your other colleagues would do the same. But I see that happening in Europe. Tell me what you see. Well, j just a couple of comments. Uh, yes, early on, my, my company, um, although the science was incomplete, uh, we, we made the policy decision that we could not take the risk um, with, with global warming uh, while we are waiting for science to settle. And that was our decision seven years ago. Um, what we have been asking... Would you put a price on that risk Would, at that time? Was there a risk factor there no. for you to fail? No. No. Okay. No. no. But, but we knew that we were in the carbon business and we knew that our business emits greenhouse gases and that we needed to start uh, and we implemented a number, number of things that have been referenced here internally. I think the important thing, though, there, there is a missing link now. We are seven years down the road and we still don't have any way to price and market carbon in this country. So even though you can do some things internally, we are now faced with, with these refineries we are talking about with greenhouse gas emission increases of CO2. And if you can't sequester it, there is no market mechanism for us to be able to move forward. So even seven years later, we do have the inability to have acted on a piece of legislation. Uh, and and we are hoping to be a part of that. Okay. One of, one of my other concerns is that most of you here talked about the barriers that federal government or, or maybe even local government have 
have uh, put up roadblocks for you to develop those current uh, leases that you have. Could you tell me specifically why you have not been able to develop those leases that you currently have that have about 80 percent of the oil, the U.S. oil, that is available? And I will go to Mr. Simon. I don't know of any that we are not developing. Is those that we already have access to are developing as rapid a fashion as we can. Go on to the next. Speaker. Leases are generally a 10-year uh, time horizon. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, we are continuously evaluating where we can best use our technology and science uh, to, to develop those leases. Uh, sometimes 10 years isn't long enough because of the uh, tremendous capital expenditure that is necessary. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, it is easily a billion dollars now for a major uh, deep water project in just one lease. But then how do you explain your record profits that are well over $1 billion? Well, the that profits can't are, be redirected in some way or apportioned. The profits are cumulative around the world, uh, but in the case of, uh, let's say, the Gulf of Mexico, we're limited by the amount of manpower that we have. I mean, we, we can't, we don't have the kind of human resource that can do all of the leases simultaneously, and and so we do. So, so the obstacle isn't from the federal government. That's it's a market obstacle. That's yeah, your obstacle. The federal government's obstacle has been to prohibit the granting of leases in the Outer Continental Shelf more broadly. Had we had the confidence that we could do more leasing, we would be scaling up our operations to go after more leases. I am not, not sure whether there is a misunderstanding here, but certainly all the leases that we have that we have spent money on with the government, we are working on and trying to develop. And we obviously I, we work the biggest prospects. I mean, once you get a lease, then you, you do some work on you do some seismic work, you do some drilling, and you see which ones are the best to to develop and we develop them. We, after a period but there is different stages after, of that development. Yeah, but after a period so of time. Not all of them all are. After the spigot time, isn't open on all of them, is what I am trying to get at. Time, if we don't do something, we have to turn them back to the government. So we are we're working on the leases. You asked another question about uh, uh, so many years ago. Twenty years ago, Chevron uh, started developing geothermal energy in California. Today, Chevron is the largest geothermal energy company in the world. It is still a relatively small in the scale of the world's energy business, but it is 1,200 megawatts of power. So, there, so I think we have been doing this for many, many years. Mr. It's Chairman, just, could I just ask makes a difference. if we could get from the witnesses a listing of those current leases and at what stage they are at, so I have a better understanding of uh, what is in existence, what is being utilized and what is not. Okay, the gentlelady has propounded that request. Would the, would the uh, witnesses at the table be willing short to? Short example. When when leased acreage has become available, for example, two Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico uh, deep water lease rounds last fall, a recent Chuck Cheese Sea lease round off Alaska, ConocoPhillips has been high bidder on a billion dollars uh, for those leases. So we are starved for access. Access really is the issue. Right, well, we would ask for that information to be provided for the record to the committee. The gentlelady's time has expired. Gentleman from um, uh, Oklahoma, for what purposes the gentleman seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter uh, the National Petroleum Council's book, The Hard Truths, Facing the Hard Truths About Energy. If I could submit this. Without objection, record. it will be included Thank in the record. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair, gen uh, chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth mm -hmm. Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On March 24th, Patrick Barter wrote in the Wall Street Journal that, quote, Without biofuels, oil prices would be even higher, unquote, than they are now. His report cited Francisco Blanche at Merrill Lynch as observing that according to the piece, quote, oil and gasoline prices would be about 50 percent higher, 15 percent higher if biofuel producers weren't increasing their output, unquote, meaning oil would be priced above $115 per barrel. Uh, do you do each of you agree with Blanche's analysis? Yes or no, and if not, why not? I think there's a uh, an argument there. Uh, roughly five percent of liquid fuels is now uh, ethanol in this country. Uh, some small amounts of biodiesel. I think there would be some impact, but I don't know that it would be fifteen percent. I, I think any amount of additional energy in the world will directionally lower prices. So more oil would lower prices, more gas would lower prices, more coal, more biofuels. So I have no doubt that it has some marginal effect. I would be very surprised if it is as big as you suggest. Certainly directionally, I, I would agree. Uh, that is why we need all forms of energy. And I, I would agree. 
I, I would just point out, I think you have got to look at the cost associated with producing biofuels versus gasoline out of crude. You look at $5 a barrel or $5 per bushel corn price today and $100 per barrel crude, the production cost of biofuels is about $3.15 a gallon and out of crude is $2.70. So it is hard for me to see how that would have a positive impact in terms of the price of gasoline that people pay in terms of the biofuel effect. So you don't agree, Mr. Simon, that it has any impact whatsoever in light of what you claim to be the production costs of corn ethanol today? I think we have got to be careful if you think you are lowering the price that the consumer pays at the pump by mandating a higher cost liquid fuel that goes in, into uh, producing. Right. I understand you probably have been opposed to the renewable fuel standard, either the one that we included in the 2005 Act or even the one that we recently passed. Is that correct, Mr. Simon? Our, our corporation does not think that mandates and subsidies is the right approach. What is the percentage of ethanol that ExxonMobil blends in U.S. gasoline today? Today we blend about 8 percent. 8 percent. And so you would be blending that even if there wasn't a renewable fuel standard? No, that is not correct. I think if there were not a renewable fuel standard, it, it, it would be lower than that. And do any of your companies support higher ethanol blends beyond E10 in light of recent studies that suggest a blend of 20 percent and even 30 percent ethanol increase uh, fuel efficiency and do not uh, pose um, any types of damage, uh, corrosive damage to the vehicles as some have suggested? Well, well, to start with, we are working in uh, California to get the, uh, the limit raised from 5.7 percent, which is today's limit in California because of environmental restrictions, uh, to 10 percent. So that is the first place we have got to go. Uh, I do believe that going over 10 percent in the nation would stretch the, the food system to the point that, that you don't want to go any further. So we have to be working on second generation, second generation ethanol from cellulosic conversion, and we are working as hard as we know how to generate that kind of technology and produce that kind of stuff. So going beyond 10 percent across the country would not work in today's environment. Uh, you mentioned the impact on food prices. And I think that there was perhaps some suggestion of this, Mr. Simon, in, in a comment you made in your opening statement about uh, developing alternative fuels and leading to unintended consequences. Yes. Um, do any of you have any independent analysis that you can share with the committee that it has been the cost of the price per bushel of corn or wheat that has directly led uh, to the increase in food prices and what percentage that constitutes versus energy costs associated with processing or transporting the food? I, I do not that I am aware of. None of you have any independent analysis to make I think that claim? There independent studies done in that regard, but we certainly don't have it. Okay. But you are but citing, but you tend to cite the oh, I, I, there's no doubt. I believe, based on all that I've read from lots of different places, that the that the price of food has been impacted by the requirement to turn a lot of corn into ethanol. And do, would you also agree with the statement, though, that the price of food is also affected by increased energy costs? Sure. But you're, you haven't done any independent analysis that would break down the percentages associated with energy versus other commodities. I have not. Okay. Uh, well, my time's up, so I'll yield the, the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Oh, one last question: Are any of the other four companies, other than ConocoPhillips, test marketing E85 or biodiesel? Yes, uh, Shell has a test market in Chicago, where we're looking at uh, consumer acceptance of of the uh, product. We, we've got a test going with the state of California, with uh, several hundred vehicles that are running on E85, and we sell E85 at a very small number of our service stations around the country. Right. We have E85 only about 30 service stations. We have limited E85. We are waiting on some pump approvals, but we do have it under the canopy now. The gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and forgive me if my questions were already asked by somebody I was across the street at another hearing. Um, I wanted, first of all, to comment on my colleague and my friend from Tennessee, who is no longer here, but uh, uh, Ms. Blackburn's uh, statement that the actions of Congress uh, so far on energy have not gotten results. And I would just point out that, um, as I understand it, the uh, attempt by the House to take back the $14 billion the previous Congress had given in tax breaks to oil companies has not passed the other body or been signed by the President. So that has no effect on what is going on. And secondly, the energy bill we passed with the CAFE standards increased was signed 
in December, just a couple months ago, and therefore, uh, you know, we're looking at 2020 before that goal was supposed to be reached. So one couldn't reasonably expect that that uh, action would already be uh, doing much visibly. Um, here's a question. I've got a constituent who called one of our offices in, uh, in Carmel, New York, and said, I just bought myself a flex fuel vehicle. Where can I get some flex fuel? And our staff had to disappoint her by telling her that, to our knowledge, there were only two pumps uh, in New York at the time uh, uh, selling E85. And the question is, to the extent that you have uh, stations, I understand many gas stations are independently operated, but many others are run under the flag of your companies. Uh, could you or would you have a policy or make a commitment to have at least one biofuel pump at each gas station? And, uh, and if not, why not? Uh, forgive me if you've already answered that question, but uh, maybe Mr. Simon and then down the row. No, I would not make that commitment. We don't make uh, biofuels, therefore we cannot uh, warranty it, and therefore we would not want to sell it under our brand. We do not deny our dealers the right to do so, but they simply cannot do that under our brand. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Hoffmeister. I mentioned a few minutes ago that we do have a pilot project at company-owned stations in Chicago in which we are testing the market acceptance of E85. I must say that the results are very poor to date from a consumer acceptance standpoint. Uh, but we do not prohibit our independent dealers and franchisees across the nation from making a decision uh, to put a, a pump on their site. Thank you very much. I am sorry for cutting off. I just have a short time here. Yeah, I mean, the Same. The, va the vast majority of service stations in the United States who are flying a Chevron flag are independently owned. Right. They are they're entitled to put in uh, if they want, a, they a can fuel pump it. if they want. They have, okay. to, they have to make sure that, it's, you know, that it doesn't interfere with the brand. But they can do that, and some have. Okay. Yes. Hello. Conoco Phillips is test marketing uh, E85. Potentially, uh, we've identified over 2,500 sites. But as uh, Mr. Hoffmeister noted, so far the consumer acceptance hasn't been very strong. And Mr. Malone. And we we do have uh, sites uh, that are non-BP owned that have E85. We don't prohibit it. We're very concerned, though, about the UL listing on the pump. Right. Okay. Uh, diesel, obviously. Uh, is a different kettle of fish. I mean, I'm burning it's a similar uh, fuel, burning 20 percent biodiesel in my home heating oil, and it doesn't seem to require uh, an adjustment to the system. I have friends who have driven off the, off the lot diesel uh, uh, vehicles made in America that were driven actually on 100 percent biodiesel uh, from wood in this particular instance. But I wanted to ask uh, if you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, uh, the Fisher Tropes reaction and the uh, use by the Nazis during World War II to make liquid fuels from coal. There have been some studies recently showing that this can be done taking carbon dioxide from the air, and especially in parts of the country where there is nearly constant sunshine or nearly constant wind, to use uh, renewables as the, uh, the driver for this process. Uh, are you aware of this, or is this among the things that any of you are studying? Uh, Mr. Hoffmeister, maybe you would go first on that. Our, our work thus far has been on solid uh, materials, uh, not gaseous materials, uh, other than natural gas, which we are um, turning into a liquid form for fuel purposes. Um, uh, well, we, we have a global joint venture with Sasol of South Africa, who have been the, the uh, main users of Fisher Tropes technology, and we are building a, a gas to liquids plant using Fisher Tropes technology. But I am not aware of a system that can take carbon dioxide out of the air, if that is what you were saying. It might be worth looking into, and it would be a huge uh, a public relations boon, not to mention, uh, I think, a money maker for you. And the last question, I guess I would ask you, because I'm, it's amazing how fast five minutes runs out, but I, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, if I could be imprecise here, uh, if you are making, say, two gazillion dollars of profit in a given time period, would you consider using half a gazillion or a quarter of a gazillion or whatever, however much of your advertising budget to now that a number of you have said conservation is important, demand management is important, would you, as a patriotic move, uh, and for the good of, I think, all of us uh, in the United States, certainly our national security, use some piece of your advertising budget to tell people that, that they should conserve, that it's patriotic to conserve, and that it's certainly good for Shell does your, that in all of its 14,000 branded stations across the country currently. I think Good. if you have been looking at Chevron advertising, you see a lot about conservation, but absolutely. Yes, we are already doing that. We are already doing We are a strong proponent of using our products more efficiently and uh, work 
hard to educate the public in that regard. I will be looking for that advertising uh, more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, gentlemen's time has expired, and uh, all time for questions by the members of the Select Committee has expired. But Mr. Stupak has been uh, waiting for two hours and 40 minutes uh, to ask questions. And, uh, uh, and uh, Ms. Jackson Lee has been a more recent arrival, but, um, but uh, out of courtesy to them, uh, I make a unanimous consent request. Uh, that they be allowed as a guest of the Select Committee to ask questions uh, of the uh, witnesses who are testifying before us here today. Mr. Chairman, uh, reserving the right to object, uh, uh, I am not sure that a committee can, uh, uh, by unanimous consent, suspend a House rule that applies to the committee. And I am looking specifically at House Rule 11, paren 2, paren G, paren 2, paren C. Uh, which says that other members are welcome at committees, but in a non-participatory manner. Um, and I would ask the chair to withdraw the unanimous consent request because I don't think that it is proper and uh, com in, comp in compliance with the rules to waive a House rule uh, in a committee. Well, I, I, I uh, if, if the gentleman would yield, I yield. Um, under House custom, uh, any one of its rules can be waived by unanimous consent. Uh, and, uh, and again, I re-make uh, that, uh, that well, uh, proposal to the members of the committee well, that we well, waive the rule by unanimous consent. Well, reclaiming my time, I don't think that we can waive a House rule in committee. I think that that requires you know, an action by the House largely through the Rules Committee, so I object. The uh, chair hears an objection, and um, and as a result, the chair is constrained by that objection to recognize the uh, guests of the committee. Um, Jim, if you're going to object, why didn't you tell us three hours ago? Well, I, I moved to strike the last word. Uh, I did not know that there would be this request that would be made. It was not cleared with the minority. I. Uh, I, I, I apologize to the gentleman uh, from uh, Michigan. Uh, I, I appreciate the um, no apologies necessary. What goes around comes around. Position that uh, the gentleman has. Been. I thank you for extending the offer, Mr. Chairman. It's an important issue, and uh, we are here for that reason. I was here from starting from 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, gentleman lady. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so we've reached the uh, conclusion of um, this hearing. Um, I, I would say to the um, oil company executives that, uh, as President Kennedy used to say, that to those whom much is given, much is expected. Uh, there has been a windfall of revenues which has uh, fallen to the uh, oil companies represented here uh, over the last several years. It is highly likely to continue this year and into the indefinite future. Uh, I think that uh, with uh, that great uh, opportunity uh, that you have been given, uh, there is a responsibility that you have to discharge. Uh, as I asked uh, earlier, uh, there should be a, a commitment that each of you make. I would recommend that it be 10 percent of your profits go into renewable uh, energy projects. Uh, we will not be able to solve uh, this global climate challenge. Uh, unless you do so. You are the leading energy companies in our country uh, and in the world. We cannot solve this problem uh, without your full participation. And similarly, uh, consumers uh, will not uh, be able to deal with this issue without your focused attention upon them. Uh, the poorest, the working class, are going to be devastated. They will have to choose between heating and eating. We are reaching that point in our country. And it is your responsibility uh, to deal with this issue in a responsible fashion. Uh, to the extent to which you don't have to take all of this as profit and you can lower your prices, I think you should do so. Uh, to the extent to which uh, you can deal with this as an issue of speculation in the marketplace and you can support the deployment of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which I recommend as a way of piercing the speculative bubble, 
I recommend that you take that position. I recommend that you take any position that helps the consumer and uh, that will help this renewable energy revolution. But that is up to you. But all I can tell you is, and I can predict this with a guarantee, that this is the first of many hearings that you are going to have this year before the Congress. My father always said, try to start out where you are going to be forced to wind up anyway. And so I am asking you each uh, to deal with that issue of the amount of your profits that you put into renewable energy resources this year and for every subsequent year, and to also deal with this issue of how it is going to affect the blue collar and poor citizens of our country. Uh, we thank you each for your testimony here before us today. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. public affairs programming on C-SPAN. Up next, Republican presidential candidate John McCain visits his high school alma mater.